we are living in unprecedented times. A simple virus, a COVID-19 virus, has created great disruption to lives and livelihoods, not only in India, but across the rest of the world. It has created grievous disruption to supply chains across the world. Uh, it has created national lockdowns under whose effect we are all still reeling. But more importantly, it has also created a fear of uncertainty of what the future holds for us in a COVID-19 world that continues to extend because of the various variants and also because of other probable global pandemics lurking in the horizon. It's created a fear of uncertainty of other issues that we have not yet tackled, like climate change related issues, which we have talked about and which are very important for us to all consider. And we have not experienced the full ferocity of a climate change related issue. At the same time, it has also brought to very stark focus the problems because of socio-economic divide, the digital divides, the divide between the haves and the have-nots, especially in a country like India, which is a very large country with 1.3 billion people. Uh, we have more than 715 districts in our country, more than 650,000 villages, and more than 8,000 small towns and cities, with only eight tier one cities which are advanced in terms of capabilities, of uh, meeting the lives and livelihoods of many people from a quality perspective. So these are all the various challenges that it has brought to stark focus and also the need for us to be aware of the challenges ahead that we have in being able to ensure a sustainable world for us all to live in. But at the same time, I would say that the COVID-19 has brought to focus the tremendous advances that civilization has made since its birth and the advancements in global collaboration, global connectivity, the advancements in technology, processes, manufacturing, and research and innovation has all come to bear for us to be able to address this particular crisis. In India in particular, uh, which I would like to focus on, we are at a very, very interesting junction. We are at a point in our history, and I would say a watershed moment in our history when we are experiencing the advantages of a demographic dividend that is the envy of many a country. More than 65% of our people are under 35 years old. More than 50% of people are under 25 years old. Now that's a tremendous advantage to have such youthful energy, such youthful enthusiasm coursing through our country. We have 1.4 million schools. We have 10,500 engineering and related institutions. We have over 39,000 colleges and we have 150 million plus young students who will be entering into the workplace over the next five to 10 years. We are a young country and will continue to be young for the next several decades. Now that is an advantage that we need to be able to leverage uh, to the advantage, not only of India, but also for the rest of the world. The second thing is we are one of the fastest growing economies of the world, growing at six to 8% barring the COVID-19 crisis, which has been a dampener for many economies. But the opportunity for India to grow even faster because of the demand of 1.3 billion people, because of the fact that we have more than 250 million people already as a part of a rising, growing economy. And we can add another 250 to 300 million people to this economy. That is giving birth to so many opportunities for entrepreneurs and for new job creators to be able to tap into. The third thing is we are living in a world of which is advancing rapidly because of exponentially changing technology. Not only is technology becoming advanced uh, from several perspectives, but it is becoming affordable, accessible, and available. And this combination, this terrific combination of a fast growing economy, a demographic dividend, and available, accessible, affordable, and advanced technology is being brought to bear to India. And therefore, the challenges that we have in India or the rest of the world have is also an opportunity for us to consider. We are a country with a billion people with a million challenges, but the million challenges are a million opportunities for us to be able to address. And that too with our young population. And that is why the government has embarked upon a series of initiatives to be able to capture this power of innovation and spur and create an ecosystem of a vibrant ecosystem of innovation and entrepreneurship across the nation. And that's why the Atal Innovation Mission of which I have been 
uh, a very happy participant too and had the opportunity to work in that initiative which was born out of the vision of the honorable prime minister to create this ecosystem of innovation and entrepreneurship so that our young kids from our school and the young students from our universities and the young people entering into the industry have an opportunity to experience an ecosystem which will allow them to blossom to their full potential and what are the technologies that have come to the fore today to help us address not only the crisis of the covid-19 world but a post covid-19 world 3d printing is revolutionizing the way you are able to conceptualize define prototype design and develop a product right in front of your eyes from your small kirana store from your humble home or from a small manufacturing setup that you have no longer do you need access to large manufacturing setups and this is a great boost for our msme industry 70% of our industry of our labor force is associated with the micro small medium enterprises and make in india becomes a reality when you are able to manufacture components uh, that the world needs whether it is electronic components or automotive components or products or handicraft or 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 uh, products that are able to be sold from jodhpur to japan from salem to seattle or from sikkim to san francisco that is what the cloud the digital reach is enabling us the globe and the world becomes a stage for every entrepreneur who embarks on an innovation journey and this is why the atal innovation mission has launched thousands of tinkering labs at a school level so that we are creating a problem solving innovative mindset in our young students like i said you have 3d printing revolutionizing manufacturing you have robotics which is driving the next degree of productivity and automation robotics is apply being applied everywhere whether it is in manufacturing plants on the shop floor or whether it is for precision agriculture where we have robots doing precise precision agriculture by watering plants to the right amount or whether it is uh, in hospitals for hospital management as a uh, ability for you to do those routine tasks on a 24 by 7 basis that a hospital needs and preventing contact when contact is not necessary so all of this is being driven by robotics and robotic process automation and then you have wireless and 5g technologies which is enabling communication across large distances in lightning uh, seconds in 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 very short periods of time and you have sensor technologies like iot which is being integrated in man machine device soil space everywhere so that you are able to collect large amounts of data whether it is it be through the sensors or through social feeds and now you have the ability to process them using big data analytics and using powerful computing nano computing super computing or quantum computing to be able to arrive at meaningful decisions and quick decisions real time decisions to take real time actions and when this is supplemented with the cloud so that you are now having not only the reach but the ability to put large amounts of data on the cloud and make it inexpensive for the young entrepreneur and uh, not to be able to purchase large amounts of storage but to leverage the cloud not only for the access to the data but also for the dissemination of the data no wonder artificial intelligence has become a reality today ai and ml machine learning because of this convergence of advanced computing advanced communications advanced data processing and big data and analytics and advanced sensor technologies all of this being converging together in an affordable manner ai has become a reality or artificial intelligence become a reality and artificial intelligence is driving a whole new slew of applications for the young innovator and the entrepreneur to be able to address problems that we have never addressed before or we thought was very difficult to address take for example during the covid 19 uh, we have been able to use uh, genomics technology and genetic technology and dna sequencing to be able to very quickly come up with a vaccine not only from other parts of the world but from india too and we are now not only one of the largest manufacturer of vaccines the covid 19 vaccine from in india Uh, or in the world but we are distributing it to many other countries isn't that a great advancement and this is the reason why the government has embarked on creating this very vibrant ecosystem of innovation and entrepreneurship 
spanning the length and breadth of our country. We have set up more than 10,000 tinkering labs, for instance, across schools, across the 715 districts. And more than 4 million young students of India are now tinkering with, playing with, in an atmosphere of fun and learning, learning about 3D printing, robotics, IoT, miniaturized electronics, augmented virtual reality, artificial intelligence, through do-it-yourself kits. These do-it-yourself kits have become affordable and accessible. But more importantly, they are able to stimulate the young mind at the school level, between grade 6 to grade 12, to look at problems they see in and around the community and use these technologies and work in groups and acquire 21st century skills, which are so important. Communication skills, social media skills, uh, ability for them to converge in groups and together deliberate and identify a solution for a problem they see day in, day out. And you have had many young students from Tutugudi to Sikkim to Salem creating solutions like solar panel IoT based irrigation management system. Now imagine an 8th standard or a 10th standard kid already getting familiar with how to leverage solar energy, how to leverage IoT, how to leverage artificial intelligence, how to leverage precision agriculture and bring it all together to help the farmers in our districts. That is what is available and therefore this is a watershed moment in our history. The Atal Innovation Mission has launched more than 100 incubation centers and community innovation centers. And these centers are fostering world-class startups. What we need are world-class incubators with world-class startups. And every university, whichever aspires to be a world-class university, they should have a world-class incubator so that young startups, young students who have the power of their intellect as well as the power of imagination are able to exercise that and create solutions in these incubators. And they're supported for a period of two to three years until they're able to stand on their own legs and launch into the world, creating unicorns or multinational companies. Thank you, CNBC, for giving me an opportunity to share a few thoughts on a very important topic of how innovation and entrepreneurship leveraging emerging technologies can benefit not only India, but the rest of the world. Hello and welcome to the AI and Cloud Summit, a virtual summit in collaboration with Dell Technologies in the age of ever-changing technology. The technology disruption is an inevitable reality for businesses today. To set the foundation for the summit, the FISAT chat will explore how companies today are leveraging emerging technologies to boost their innovation and inspiring new avenues of growth. Inviting Anand Ganapati, the country manager, enterprise at Dell Technologies, and I am Reema Tendulkar from CNBC TV 18. Anand, uh, the world has gone through a dramatic change. Um, you know, in fact, this is not a seismic change. We've, you know, we've been disrupted like nothing else. And the only thing that has been a constant in this period of uncertainty has been technology. You know, the companies have managed to keep their businesses running in this environment, uncertain environment and pivot very quickly in an ever shifting or uh, normal. In a way, you could say the last two years have been milestone years in technology. Can you tell us how companies or the way the companies approach technology post pandemic will never be the same as it was pre pandemic? So you're absolutely right, Rima. Um, you know, the last two years have been have been defining uh, you know, to the extent that life will never be the same again. Um, and while, uh, you know, a lot has changed in the way we work and, you know, in the way we, uh, in the way we are conducting business, uh, I'll not focus on that here. Uh, I'll rather focus on the fact that the, 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 the way we interact with our organizations and the way organizations interact with customers has completely changed. It has changed because the, the physical touch is no longer there. You know, the physical connect is no longer there. And, and that has brought about uh, 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 situations where organizations have tried to figure out how can they reach their customers today? How can they reach you and me to make sure that they can present their, uh, their uh, what they want to what they want to present to us? And, and that could be, you know, a company like Titan, uh, you know, somebody in the consumer products, uh, package goods space, somebody in the FMCG space, somebody in the automotive space. You know, there was a point in time when, you know, we could go into showrooms and if you look at all the automotive manufacturers, they're trying to set up virtual showrooms so that we can interact with them. 
um, you you look at you look at uh, you know uh, people people in real estate if you look at the, some of the uh, some of the uh, construction companies they all have virtual 3d walkthroughs now right so the world has changed in a way that technology has become an integral part of how uh, uh, organizations present themselves to their consumers but there is another part to it as well um, all of this uh, you know interaction with consumers also helps customer organizations connect with their consumers connect with their customers and connect with their stakeholders in very different ways to collect data so the way products are made today also has changed um, in fact uh, you know in the in the in the earlier days before the pandemic uh, you wanted to you wanted to design a car or you wanted to build a new movie or you wanted to set up some uh, uh, set up some uh, 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 graphic effects inside in uh, vfx inside a, inside a movie uh, you know people would sit together in in an office and collaborate but that's not happening today nobody is in offices but there are still very nice movies being made uh, there are still cars being introduced there are still uh, you know engineering products uh, projects being concluded and all of that is happening because of the way organizations have adapted technology to help them design manufacture and take to market and also you know manage the supply chain of the products and services they sell so everything has changed in the way uh, the whole economy works. The world economy works. Anand, uh, so the way the economy is working right now and the interconnected technologies that are present, it has led to unprecedented volumes of complex data which is being generated every minute, every second. Which brings me to the next point about edge computing, which seems to have taken off in a very big way. How should CTOs, CIOs approach edge computing? Okay, so we we spoke about we spoke about the fact that uh, you and I are consumers and we are walking uh, uh, you know data engines today, right? Uh, you have a you have a band on your wrist, you have a phone, uh, you have sensors uh, on your car. All of this is generating data, but today that data is not real time, right? The data is being generated. You upload it when you reach a point, either your service station or your uh, or your docking station in your machine at home. Where you transfer the data onto the cloud or whatever happens but uh, what's going to happen today and we all know 5g is around the corner uh, and when 5g happens you know you're going to get a boost of bandwidth you're also going to get a better latency and speeds and because of that you know the whole concept of edge is going to take off what is the edge the edge is basically uh, uh, you know points in 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 the environment around us where sensors uh, like the ones we have or like the ones that are in cars or you know different sensors will generate data but this data will be analyzed real time that data will be analyzed to benefit organizations to benefit customers like you and me real time how is that going to happen the data is going to go through a network which could be a, a, a 4g or maybe a, even better a 5g network when it comes it's going to hit a base station where there's going to be a little edge computing uh, you know um, uh, infrastructure we've got some, some servers some you know uh, some compute some graphics cards that's going to have some algorithms that people are going to write on them and that's going to process data and those algorithms are going to pump back to you and me um, you know and and you know it could be something like you, you, you your your shoes need new replacement or your car needs uh, oil and here's the nearest nearest station where you can get oil or you know something like that or it could be uh, even better in the case of uh, uh, in the case of an organization like uh, which manufactures which uses machines to manufacture stuff uh, you know that the, the vibrations uh, the vibration and and the the, the various uh, temperature measurements inside a machine could be all collated to to understand failure rates of machines better uh, and more in real time why is real time critical real time is critical because uh, that will help organizations respond to data better in fact, I was saying this a few days back. Um, data uh, follows, you know, a parabola in terms of its value. Uh, data today um, will be most relevant at the point of creation, immediately as it is created. Over time, that data will lose value, and over time, the data will gain back value. Right now, why is that the case? Because over time, when you have data, the data is going to be used. It's going to be massaged in various learning algorithms, pushed back to help in real time usage of data most of the data that is used today is not is near real time or not real time but you're going to move to a real time and that's what edge is going to help us do collect data 
and you know utilize it manage it massage it and review and and put it in the feedback loop to make sure it is used real time uh, to benefit consumers and organizations alike Okay, so you see edge computing and 5G taking off in a very big way and the two go hand in hand uh, to develop. But do we have enough uh, use cases right now? And from a CIO, CTO point of view, uh, what is the kind of strategy? What are the kind of investments that they need to make? Because I remember reading Gartner had estimated, say by 2025, 75% of the enterprise data will be generated and utilized outside of the data center. Yes. So, um, what kind of investments do they need to make, uh, or the strategy that a CTO needs to keep in mind to get extract maximum value from edge computing? It's an amazing question. Uh, I think the first thing that uh, people need to do is to figure out what to do with the data, right? Uh, there's, there, there, you know, uh, there's enormous amounts of data that we are uh, uh, creating uh, every day, and we will create even more as we add sensors to our lives, as sensors get added into our lives. Uh, so any organization that wants to use this data needs to a figure out what do you want to do with it what what's the business use case how are you going to use it that's the first part and that's more organization strategy and stuff uh, second thing that they need to do is figure out how to manage this data and i think that's the more critical part today there are ways of managing the data but today as i said some data is near real time uh, real time to near real time but most of the data is not real time you collect the data, you aggregate it, and you kind of you kind of average it out and say, okay, this is the data. You know, using this, you you do some historical analysis and tend to use it. Most of it is that way. Uh, banks tend to use some of the data near real time. Uh, like you have a credit card. Um, you know, when you when you do a transaction of a certain size, you immediately get a phone call uh, from a bank saying, did you do it? And that's not immediate, but it's it's got a gap in it, right? Now, uh, how nice would it be if when you, as you're swiping the card, okay, uh, as you swipe the card, the data goes, it, it collects itself, it goes to a set of machines, uh, those machines do what they have to do. And as the card is being swiped, you have a point where the, the transaction is cut off saying, you know, this is not a genuine transaction or the transaction is let to go ahead. That's real time. That's when you are swiping, the bank has done its analysis, its risk analysis saying, this is the right thing to do. This, this is a genuine user and a genuine swipe of the card, or this is not genuine. Now, for that, you know, you need to use the data. If you see data that's generated through sensors, the data is not at points in time. You will get data as a continuous stream. It's called streaming data. Uh, any data that comes out of sensors, whether they are on your watch or, 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 uh, or on machines or in your cars, they're generating data all the time. Now, to extract maximum value of data, you need to look at this data as a stream and not as individual data points. To do that, Dell Technologies has, um, uh, you know, this platform called a stream data platform, which allows you to store the data as a stream and not as uh, binary objects or, uh, you know, point in time objects. Um, what happens is the data is relevant when it is a stream because there is a time access to it. The data may remain constant over a period of time, but it's got a time access. So the streaming data platform and using streaming data is a big thing that CIOs, CTOs must think of as they plan to use the data real time. And, and that's where we will, we will be able to step in because the streaming data is the most important thing when you want to set in place AI and ML algorithms to use the stream data. And protecting and storing the stream data is of utmost importance as you come down this path of, of putting various types of data together. So you're not going to just analyze one kind of stream data. There are going to be many different types of data sets that you're going to have to put together to be able to make sense out of the data. And that's what uh, uh, a streaming data platform like what we have in Dell Technologies will do. And then you build your uh, AI engines on top, you build your learning algorithms on top, and then you uh, your business rules on top of it. And then you have, you know, you, you have a, a big data platform that you will create that will help you, um, you know, deliver value to your business and to your uh, stakeholders and customers. So you would say the smart investments in technology today are cloud, AI, ML, edge computing? Absolutely. Uh, the, smart, the smart investments, all of these are investments for tomorrow. You will do, make those investments today, but this is what will define uh, an enterprise tomorrow because data is possibly the new IP of every company. Every company is, is possibly exists to somehow unlock the value of the data that they are receiving or they can collect. 
and that is the IP. And, and all of these platforms put together uh, will help you derive value out of the data. Alan, another point I wanted to get your thoughts in is um, many of the Indian companies are old economy companies. They have legacy businesses as well as infrastructure. How do they go about modernizing their infrastructure and core? Uh, two parts of it, and it's just not Indian companies. I think all companies yeah, are trying to adapt to this new reality of of, uh, of a cloud uh, of a cloud like environment and adapting to data. Um, you know, two parts to it. You've got to modernize your your entire infrastructure, which has both IT and applications. We spoke of how to modernize the the IT or the the, the technology, the infrastructure piece, which is to cloud and bring in security and you know do a do a single pane of glass management. But equally, you know, at the end of the day, your data is going to be uh, consumed by you and also by your by your stakeholders and consumers through your applications. And, and it is equally important to be able to modernize those applications to for the data for the data world, uh, which which is of, of course built on on uh, on uh, various devices. And uh, a very important thing that uh, a lot of our customers and we are uh, where we are that we are working with. Uh, are going down is to go down the path of application modernization because as you would have heard uh, this today is the world world of kubernetes and python and, and things like that uh, so it is important that applications are ready uh, in the new world um, uh, you know for for that environment and uh, that's a whole journey that customers are are undertaking uh, we are uh, we are engaged with them in transforming not only their infrastructure but also their application space uh, to make them future ready and you know, even as I, you know, CTOs, CIOs have the opportunity to deliver more business value than ever before, they're also under pressure. You know, they have to make sure their systems work seamlessly. They'll be able to scale on demand, uh, hold up against increasing regulatory demands, and more importantly, against intensifying security threats. Could you talk about the challenges that uh, you know some of these uh, leaders face, and how a technology partner can help overcome that? Um, uh, three things, um, you know, three things that, uh, you know, have, have been challenges and will become even bigger uh, challenges or even bigger uh, 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 points that need to be addressed. Okay. Uh, security, you dealing with a lot of data. Um, now this data, I've already said, uh, is my point of view that uh, it will become, it will become the, it will become the, uh, the IP that a company runs on. So securing this is of absolute importance to that organization now. And uh, you need to look at security holistically. So as a CI CTO, your data is sitting on laptops, it's sitting in the data center, it's sitting on the edge, it's sitting on devices that people are carrying. Look at security holistically. And at Dell Technologies, we can look at the security holistically, and we can also make sure that your data is protected against uh, uh, cyber attacks in, in our cyber resi resiliency services portfolio, where we make sure that this data, while it is with you, is completely disconnected from the rest of the world. But it is with you so that's the first thing the second thing that you need to take care of is scalability now when you use this data you need to make sure that there are uh, your infrastructure is ready to be able to absorb this data and scale and and you know scalability today is a cloud journey of some sort we call it the multi-cloud hybrid cloud journey where we believe the future is one where you will have your own cloud in your data center but you will also end up leveraging public clouds of of, of public cloud service providers uh, but the fact is, wherever, whichever, whichever infrastructure you use, the data is your own, and you need to you need to protect it in the same way that you would the way it is in your data center. So, with the with the hybrid cloud, multi, uh, with the hybrid cloud story that we have and the cloud uh, Dell Technologies cloud platform that we bring you, you will be able to manage your data across different types of cloud using a single plane of glass. That's the second thing that you need to look at. How are you going to keep your infrastructure manageable in a single plane of glass? And the third thing is resiliency. Um, all of this data needs to be protected for poster and, and, and saved for posterity. Um, whole host of whole host of products which will help you secure this data and keep it safe with you. So those are the three tenets that I would say uh, are important for a CIO uh, or an organization even more than before. And uh, somebody like Dell Technologies has products and services across all of these uh, areas to help you um, become a data-driven organization uh, even better than before. 
Uh, Anand, it's a pleasure speaking with you. Some interesting insights on how technologies like cloud, AI, ML, edge computer, 5G are all coming together to develop intelligent devices for a connected workforce uh, in a way, helping companies scale up to ensure that they truly transform for the long term, they're future ready, they're crisis proof. Technology is clearly playing a very, very important role in business today. Thank you, Anand, Thank you. Uh, once again. Enhancing business intelligence with technology, driving business process optimization. How are artificial intelligence and machine learning changing the brand consumer relationships for retailers? And how can we build an impactful AI framework? What should be the appropriate strategy? Hello and welcome to AI and Cloud Summit, a virtual summit in, brought in collaboration with Dell Technologies. Joining me in this conversation today, we've got Saurabh Tukral, the Senior Specialist at Niti IO, Mr. Kurian Xavier, Director of Solution and Alliances, at Dell EMC India, Mr. Venkat Vardarajan, the head of cloud and digital Intel India, and Mr. Kumar Rajkopalan, CEO Retailers Association, and I am Reema Tendulkar from CNBC TV 18. Gentlemen, a warm welcome uh, to this discussion, and thank you very much uh, for taking the time out and speaking to us. Uh, that's from the enterprise point of view. From a government standpoint, can you talk about the innovations that we're seeing? Now, Niti Aayog is promoting a culture of innovation and entrepreneurship. India has the aspiration to be a trillion-dollar digital economy. Where have we seen AI adoption at the government level? So from a government point of view, we are looking for adoption of AI technology for citizen services. The Honorable Prime Minister has the vision of minimum government, maximum governance. Emerging technology can play a very important role to achieve this vision. We are seeing use cases of all the emerging technologies like AI, ML, IoT, and blockchain in the sector of education, healthcare, and agriculture. AI technologies can be used in precision agriculture, quality assaying, marketing linkages, and agri-credit and insurance for the agri agriculture sector. In education, low-tech interventions and personalized learning can help in improving learning outcomes. And we have many, many use cases of healthcare uh, in like, uh, we, we can use AI, AI-enabled diabetics, uh, diabetics retinopathy validation, uh, we we can have uh, major, uh, measurement measuring the weight of infant by taking images and AI would predict what's the weight of that infant. Uh, and then we are able to, uh, AI can be used to create a bio bank. So these are the potential of AI across the priority sectors and, uh, and the technology can be game changer there. Uh, Venkat, the last two years were all about establishing the right infrastructure to ensure business you know, continuity. We had to get all the employees enabled to work from home. But now as we look towards the future and progress towards economic recovery, what is the right technology infrastructure to drive innovation through artificial intelligence and machine learning? When you think about digital transformation, there are, um, there are multiple pillars and multiple enabling elements to that journey. At Intel, we broadly see uh, four major pillars for the digital transformation for any organization. At the core of it, at the backbone for this is the cloud. Cloud as an operating model where you can try newer ideas, fail fast, and then try again and succeed and go to market faster. On top of cloud, the first major trend we see is AI. AI is there everywhere, right, from the app you use to order food to the site you use for shopping, AI is there everywhere. According to O'Reilly survey, 85% of organizations have already implemented some sort of AI um, in their organizations. The second, the second major trend we see is 5G. As you know, many telecom companies in India have already done trials on 5G. So with 5G, you get much faster speed of data and at a much lower latency. What that means is 
for organizations you will have newer and newer use cases it can be immersive video or it can be um, the industrial robots connected robots at the edge right so there are multiple use cases that's possible so as a end user as an organization you should start thinking about what are the use cases that you can do with 5g third and last is the intelligent edge as we call what that means is as as the data the more and more data goes to the edge there needs to be computing at the edge to process the data to have more intelligent at the edge like this is what we call intelligent edge so the cloud on top of the cloud ai and then 5g with 5g more and more compute going towards the edge these are all the three uh, three broad elements enabled by cloud as the fourth major backbone that we see happening in the industry for this decade okay so ai 5g as well as edge computing and cloud of course remains the backbone infrastructure uh, kareen a technology is always adopted to solve a business problem and you have many clients in your fold can you tell us some of the interesting solutions which have had ai ml uh, at its core neema there's a there's a bunch of stuff that's going on as far as uh, as far as ai and every time one of us interacts with the internet we probably already touching some ai system in, in that's out there if you're uh, if you're browsing an e-commerce portal uh, in all probability the recommendation engine that's sitting below that tells you have you also looked at this is uh, is running off a, uh, is running off an ai engine now now the large web scalers have always used ai to to analyze data to be able to do better at uh, at reaching out to customers that that uh, technology that was developed largely for uh, for the for the big players that are out there is starting to get uh, is starting to get utilized by the by anyone that has data really um, if you look at video surveillance ai has penetrated quite significantly if you look at factory automation it could be something as simple as safety to to make sure that someone's not got his hand inside a machine while it's uh, wh while it's working um, or it could be something as advanced as uh, as saying look at a at a person's face and and understand the sentiment to uh, to be able to know whether whether a worker is going to work efficiently or not um and and that's just video uh there's there's other sides to it right you can you can use data in uh, of inventory to go and make sure that your inventory is right you can uh, you can use data from from a delivery service to make sure that people that uh, that a delivery van is taking the right route depending on uh, on the number of places that he needs to go stop at so uh the the utilization of data to be able to make those decisions is starting to become more pervasive we are starting to see it in in a wide variety of in, of industries we are starting to see it in pretty much every walk of life and um, and it's uh, and it's and it's largely improving quality of life and quality of business uh, across the board uh you know you spoke about uh, many solutions but i think the one which stood out is employers able to gauge the sentiment of employees by watching the video that's a bit scary it reminds me of 1984 the book big brother is uh, watching you uh, but kumar you know both um, krishna uh, you know venkat as well as kurian spoke about how ai is pervasive especially when it comes to shopping in fact this side our movie choices as well and we've got that element of real time personalization which is coming now consumer has always been at the forefront of adopting technology can you tell us what your key observations are about using innovation yeah thank you i think uh, the stage has got set in terms of understanding what ai can do as a consumer i think a whole lot of change and because i represent the retail industry it's easier for me to talk about the consumer uh, the recommendation engine that was spoken about earlier uh, is a very big boon for consumers imagine if you had to buy just one pen and if you have to go online you'll be inundated with so much of choices today that you'll find it difficult to make a very meaningful uh, choice now the advantage of having ai is that it can really zero down on what is the kind of thing that would be useful for you as a consumer similarly 
a consumer is looking at getting what they want they are looking at making sure that it comes to them as fast as possible and it is also that the consumer wants to be able to get all kinds of uh, advantages that will go along with doing any kind of buying now all this gets enhanced because of ai and the pandemic has helped retailers in ensuring that they get digitally better in taking care of consumers i think end of the day it's about retaining the consumer making relevance to consumers and therefore creating value to the consumers from a retailer standpoint things have also changed because they are able to use ai for multiple things one to make sure they are giving what they want to the customer at the time that they want second part is that they are able to interact with their entire supply chain to make things available reduce wastage at the same time and make sure that uh, they can create newer and innovative product based upon what and how customers are reacting to various offerings they don't need to necessarily manufacture everything and keep all the time and this really reduces the inventory levels it also helps them in collaborating i mean we talked about how the food companies uh, are working now the food companies can collaborate with the supermarket can collaborate with other companies that's possibly going to take care of travel all kinds of companies can now collaborate to make sure that consumers lives get much better so i think they are going to lots more collaborative efforts as day goes forward because of this superb ai abilities and the collaboration abilities that that the digital technologies can bring in so that is what we've seen up until uh, now what about uh, in the future now you already spoke about automation and personalization in a way having become mainstream when it comes to uh, the consumer facing businesses what is next when it comes to using ai as well as ml to drive innovation i think the biggest part of what's going to happen is going to be at the back end because like i said if you want to create the right product at the right time and give it to the right customer reduce wastages it cannot be done by one company or two companies or three companies it's about a complete collaboration of various companies coming together to make the right kind of things happen for consumers so this is the is the large part of what will happen as days go forward i'm sure and i'm sure the other panelists should bring in other aspects to this but this is not necessarily only about internet shopping and i'll need to bring this to to, to four i think it's going to change the way we shop irrespective of whichever channel we go to and that's where the beauty is kumar remains the same irrespective of whether he is going online he is going offline he is going to see as seen on tv kind of shopping networks or somebody who is going to call up and tell me what's available on just telephones because that individual is now known and the ability to create value around an individual for the purpose of that individual can get enhanced because of ai and that i don't think any other technology could have easily wrapped around for them that that ability to find that kumar at that mood and to create that right kind of item for that kumar in that mood is what is going to happen with this kind of technologies and we'll have to wait and watch i think eventually i had hopes to that as soon as you think you need something you should be able to get it at your place wherever it is that you want now that would be the ultimate we'll have to wait and watch i'm sure there are things happening around this but that's where things are going to go to i'm very sure okay so ai is not going to be limited to just uh, the online options or internet shopping it's going to be pervasive even in the offline mode of uh, shopping and of course we'll get some more color and how soon we can you know reach there and the kind of innovation dell as well as intel can bring to achieve that but i want to move on to another sector and that is uh, you know healthcare because right now the need of the r is clearly healthcare as we all as, you know all countries battle uh, covid and india per se has had a problem of accessibility affordability of quality healthcare so here the use of technology can uh, be a big disruptor as well as uh, be a game changer um, so venkat would you like to throw in your thoughts on using technology for the healthcare vertical in particular yeah absolutely see the um, with healthcare as you know rima um, the number of doctors per 1000 people in india the ratio is quite low right so it is impossible um, for the medical system to reach each and every citizen in the country so one example that we have worked with um, a company called netra.ai what we have done is um, with the retina scan you can predict a diabetic eye issue okay so now um, if you go to your eye clinic it's easy for the doctor to find out hey um, are you going to get a get a eye issue or not right um, 
but if you expand the problem into millions and billion people across india how do we reach them right if we just have a retina scan and this ai system can accurately predict what is the probability that you are going to get a diabetic vision issue right so this this particular solution is scaling across the country so like this ai can be applied uh, for problems at scale where you scan analyze the image and arrive at accuracy of prediction that is in many cases even higher than the human specialist that is the area where we are focused on rima rima let me add a little bit to that as well so uh, in in the medical field there's there's a lot of companies that are doing some fairly cutting edge right um, whether it's uh, uh, breast cancer detection or like uh, like venkat said about uh, uh, about uh, diabetes detection but uh, in, in covid for example there's uh, there are people that are looking at x rays of lungs and and uh, saying what is uh, how how much uh, what percentage of damage and most of the time uh, an ai algorithm because it's seen so many millions can have a fairly uh, can sometimes have a bet, have better accuracy than a than an uh, than a radiologist or or a or a doctor that's taking a look at this um, uh, uh, taking a look at this uh, uh, report um there was uh, there was someone that i was talking to with regard to breast cancer detection 93% is considered good with a radiologist 93% accuracy which effectively means that 7 in uh, 7 in 100 uh, the, the radiologist failed to detect it um and ai can be as much as 99.6% accurate which is uh, which is a big difference from uh, from what, uh, what what a typical radiologist is so yeah ai is not only going to to get into those fields of 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 detection but it's also going to be able to uh, it's also going to be able to be more accurate uh, very often it's not just uh, it's not just uh, making a decision it's just marking off the areas which a radiologist needs to go and pay attention to uh, and in those cases it simply makes the radiologist more more effective so um, so uh, big strides in in the medical field coming no there is no doubt uh, you know korean that uh, there is a lot of innovation you all have enumerated some very interesting uh, examples as well but have we managed to apply it at scale right now uh, korean and if not what are the challenges L- let me let me take a stab at that so this the problem the problem that existed with Uh, with ai was largely a problem of how to deliver the kind of compute that is required right um if the uh, uh, for and let me break that down for you if if you're looking at uh, you're look if you're looking at an image or you're doing analysis of a medical image you need to break that down let's say into um into half a million segments and look at uh, look at differences between and uh, di- between that image and compare it to um the 5 million images that you've got in your uh, that that the soft that the ai has has in its repository that takes a lot of compute um and the biggest challenge to uh, mass deployment has always been the availability of that compute that that problem is gone today the compute available more than is more than what is required to run some very complex uh, complex algorithms uh on top of that the software the world the 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 cloud and the cluster ecosystems that venkat spoke about a little earlier allow you to not just run it on one machine but go run it on a set of 100 machines and and the technology exists to be able to go do that uh the other problem was how do you go store all of this and and store it effectively and and that problem as well has been solved so the technology barriers are gone today the the next the next barrier was was a question of skill out that's out there in the market and uh, that uh, if you had asked me this question 3 years ago i would have told you that that ai skill in the market today is extremely expensive that's starting to fix as well uh, colleges are running it in curriculums we are we are helping colleges run it in uh, teach uh, uh, teach as part of curriculums and the availability of of fairly good um yeah, engineers that are able to use these use this data to create vi- viable outcomes is also there um 
I think that the the last barrier that we need to go and overcome is the one that uh, that and which is why we say that we are at the cusp of of a big uh, expansion in AI is because the, we are at the last stage right now to be able to identify the use case and to and to then implement on it. So, can you share your thoughts on uh, healthcare? Clearly, there is the need of the hour as India fights COVID. In what ways are technologies like artificial intelligence, machine learning being applied in the healthcare sector? And any challenges that you see? Like I was mentioning, AI can play a very important role in healthcare. And what Niti Aayog is doing is we are validating the AI technology on the ground, understanding what are the implementation challenges what are the challenges faced by the stakeholders and ecosystem to really scale up the technology in that aspect we have taken up a lot of pilots projects to understand how we can bring the technology to mainstream we are doing pilots for ai enabled diabetics retinopathy and here we have seen the challenges that uh, the machine will Will be will help the doctors and the nurses, but at the same time we need to also ensure that the digital literacy is there at the hospital to really use those AI applications. We need to also ensure that we have good support system to uh, to resolve if there are any issues uh, while using that machine. So uh, we would need. Uh, uh, a presence of engineers at the same time we need to also ensure that the basic infrastructure of electricity and internet is available at all the psc cst districts hospitals so that we are able to leverage the technology and we are able to scale that up apart from this niti ayog is also working on uh, creating a biobank, a biobank stores the human biological samples along with the radio, radiological images, and then we can use this to really predict uh, about the disease, uh, and we are able to provide personalized advice. Uh, we are also implementing a pilot where we want to use AI application to really measure the weight of infants. Uh, we are doing the validation of the solution and the validation is against the gold standards. We want to make sure that there is trust on the technology. At the same time, we are also working, discussing, deliberating how this will get integrated to existing processes of ASHA workers. Uh, Niti Aayog also want to not just validate the efficacy of the technology, but also understand the scaling challenges. As the government ecosystem, we want to make sure the technology is scalable. So in that aspect, we have created a checklist of what all there should be there in the solution so that it is scalable. How it will get integrated to the existing systems, which is very, very important for scaling. Uh, we need to define the architecture for that and how it is supporting how it is being supported in molecular languages how it is taking care of the regional needs and the culture uh, and at the same time we also need to think from a cost angle point of view so here the objective is how we can have technology interventions which are of low cost and high impact these are the few principles we, we which we are we are using to really shortlist the AI solutions which can be implemented uh, for the citizen services and which will be a game changer in this space. Uh, Benkat, anything that you would like to it? Because, you know, the mission is to have a national digital uh, health infrastructure. India, in fact, wants to be a $1 trillion digital economy. So then Goalpost has, uh, you know, moved forward. Um, you know, in terms of uh, what is next, you know, Korean just told us that a lot of the challenges have been addressed, whether it's bridging the technology skill gap that was earlier there, the computing power on the storage side. Um, so we appear to be at an inflection point when it comes to the use cases for AI, its adoption, as well as therefore then the benefits. 
Um, anything that you would like to add in healthcare as well as apart from that, which other sector apart from consumer as well as healthcare where we are seeing AI make a big difference? Yeah, I think from the uh, from the technology perspective, Xavier covered um, um, the current status and the challenges pretty much. Um, the one thing that I would like to add is around um, the government policies around data and then adoption of AI in healthcare uh, would be very critical uh, for this to be successful at scale. What I mean by that is one, um, of course, the clarity around the private data and policies of uh, healthcare records, etc. That's the first aspect. Second is government is the major provider of healthcare across the country. You go across villages and the district headquarters, the government healthcare center is the main hospital where the people come for treatment too. If government starts adopting it at the village clinic level, at the district hospital level, then the AI in healthcare will expand at scale. That would be my request to the policymakers. Uh, Kumar, uh, consumer expectations are also evolving very rapidly. Now we've gotten used to uh, Netflix telling us which movie perhaps we would like to watch and what should be our next on our shopping list. Um, so, you know, you refer to uh, personalization becoming fairly mainstream as well. Um, and, you know, there will be a lot of work which is done on the back end. But purely in terms of increasing engagement and shaping consumer experiences, what else can be done? Frankly, a whole lot is getting done, but it's not necessarily done by the same set of retailers at every point of time. So different people are using it differently. And you need to start thinking when, when somebody is starting something, how the others are adopting. I'll give you an example. And because I don't want to talk about individual companies, there is a very large pharma-based beauty, beauty products company that is currently using AI to give you the right kind of lipstick irrespective of which part of the world you are from, right? Just looking at the screen and doing a few things and it could just not be just lipstick, it should be multiple items. It's just scanning you, then getting some more details about your skin and giving you all kinds of things that's going to be making it not just uh, visually better, but also from, from the angle of your skin, etc. From a, from a medical standpoint, better for an individual. I've been to a footwear company that is using AI to be able to get customers, get the perfect footwear for them to be able to run the miles that they have to run. So you just wear the first set of footwear you run. It's clocking a whole lot of pressure points of your toes. And within the next one hour's time, you are getting a footwear that only you can use because it's been structured for you. So I think each one, every product, I mean, we talked about medical. The fact is, I don't think there is going to be too long before each one of us would be given insurance policies based upon our own our own health ratings. And that's being done in some form or the other other parts of the world. We will also find it happening. You may find that the medical insurance for you today is at X, but because you've done a better health management in one year, your insurance policy is actually become cheaper. So I think this is going to be a life is going to be changing for each one of us. I mean, our eyewear companies. In, in India, are already using AI to be able to give you the perfect time that you need at any point of time, depending upon your mood. Again, their moods also comes in into the picture. So I think it's about that. Now, when you look at it, it looks simplistic because you're thinking that I'm what? I mean, I'm going to be getting something which is for me. But there's a whole lot of back end work that goes behind it. There's a work to be able to make that perfect thing for you, design the right thing for you, get the manufacturers to do the right thing for you, use the right material that will come in as a component for this. So it's not as simple as you would think it is. I mean, and imagine this in the wedding scenario. One could go for a wedding and each person would be having a different concept altogether to be able to come in and showcase themselves. So I think things are going to change as a consumer. If you can open your fridge and if AI can refill every item that's there in the fridge, and that's something that people are now uh, experimenting on, you will in the next possibly two years time be able to make a smart fridge, uh, tell your nearby Kirana what you want and Kirana will supply the whole thing to you with you not even moving a finger. So these are the kind of automation that's going to happen for us as consumers. Healthcare will change, food items will change, our health styles will change. I think it's beautiful times. We just need to wait for various things to come together. Each retailer, each service provider will experiment it differently. But at some point of time, each one of them will also become the benchmark. 
that's where things go that's just one challenge is right now while we are generating a lot of data those data exist in silos so we need a way with of course consumer consent that uh, there can be collaboration amongst these uh, data generators to get a cohesive uh, solution to bring in that element of personalization across various streams uh korean you know uh, i track technology uh, companies and i remember this uh, rajesh gopinathan the ceo of tcs a year and a half two years back he had said that india is at the cusp of a technology upgrade cycle and there are three key horizons to that the first horizon is which is where the companies were in the last one year is just pure adoption of technology say migrating to cloud that is horizon 1 horizon 2 is when you use uh, the you know cloud native capabilities you use ai ml to leverage the best of cloud capabilities and to you know bring in those efficiencies uh, to you know generate value extract maximum value and horizon 3 is when uh you can actually come up with a completely different avenue stream so here i wanted to get your thoughts in we've spoken about how it's solving current business problems there is an increase in efficiency productivity that we all know what about new revenue streams have we had innovations which have opened up a different avenue stream for uh you know existing large companies purely by using ai ml as well as these emerging technologies so uh, rima and, and let me give this to you with an example right uh, and i'll give you the example that uh, that of optimizing first um there's a there's a windmill company that we work with that uh, simply put vibration and noise sensors that which is effectively a fairly sensitive mic and a vibration sensor on all of their windmills uh, now what did it do for them what it did for them is to be able to look at uh, the sound generated and the vibration of a windmill to be and look at it across a thousand windmills that are out there and to be able to say that if this sound comes it's probably this uh, gear lever that or le- or switch that that needs to get changed what it did is instead of doing periodic maintenance they they now know exactly what they need to go change let me give you the next the next step of 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 how a new business model can come about uh in uh, within dell we do a lot of uh, maintenance for all of our customers products to be a, we looked at all of that data and what we realized is that you can go and stock uh, materials or uh, the the average failure rates are different for different products now because of which we went and optimized how our uh, how our people are deployed how we go and uh, how we go and manage inventories um and and it, what it, what came out of it was a whole new way of doing uh doing maintenance customers were happy because they got service faster uh, our, our management was happy because uh, because it costs less and uh, the service engineers were happy because they they had uh, more planned routes and and they knew exactly what they needed to do every time so it was a win win across the board and it created a whole new man, uh, methodology of of this, of uh, of how service gets delivered so uh, interesting times and and all of it is coming out of data uh fascinating very very fascinating venkat uh, as operations are becoming more and more connected data security is increasingly at risk of cyber threats what recommendations do you have for improving security and enhancing visibility across the value chain yeah very 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 pertinent and relevant question right so now um everything is happening online and remotely people work from home learn from home so what happens is when everybody is online the um the exposed area or the attack surface um for a vulnerability becomes larger um so um so people have to imbibe security as a way of thinking in every step in every design that they do whether it is end user or the organization now let's take a case of you know um somebody working from home in almost every every technology use case the data goes from an end point to the cloud via network and then the internet so you have to have security at each points whether it is software security or hardware based security at the at the client or laptop side you need to have um the required antivirus security software and then 
you need to transmit the data in a secure and encrypted way to the network and then to the internet and then third on the cloud the cloud operators have established security tools and protocols and as a user you need to follow certain um, certain best practices so that your applications and data is secure on top of all that what we have done is um, rima you know on top of um, the hardware based security software based security we have enabled um, secure um, hardware enhanced private enclave uh, for data whether it is a laptop or in the server so what it does is um, uh, it allows you to process the data in a way that the operating system or any other process or any other external threat cannot access that particular area so your security becomes even more enhanced um, so all the end and end of day security uh, is a joint responsibility of the users and the organizations and we need to have it at every point of the data uh, process both hardware and the software based security um uh, venkat um also you know one concern as companies embark on this digital transformation journey is understanding what your strategy should be you know the end goal is not purely adoption right adoption of cloud or using ai for the sake of ai it is about ability to extract maximum value so when you go about you know formulating what your digital transformation strategy is what would be the key things to keep in mind to assess and understand your roi yeah absolutely so when we when we talk to customers rima we always say hey start with the need right just because ai is uh, um, is the buzzword don't don't go just implement a simple ai solution right so the um, every every transformation starts with the need uh, the need can be for you to um, compete better improve customer experience right or as zavi ross mentioning um, optimize the cost or mr kumar was mentioning um, how do we enhance user experience right so in every uh, one of the situation it is important to have a roi plan whether it is um, increase revenue increase profit or um, or even increase a brand reputation in the market right once you define define the need and the parameter to measure the success it's important for you to check whether you have all the tools and processes in place it's around um, people whether you have skilled people to do the project right and to whether you need to have um, the good ecosystem players whether it is um, uh, the oem players or software players etc which are on board which can help you in the journey and third of course have you convinced your stakeholders and the employees on the need for it yeah, effective internal communication to get the organization ready for the digital transformation is also very very important these are three things i would say need measure the roi have the tools process people and ecosystem ready and fourth have a good internal organizational communication strategy in place so the government has a big role to play when it comes to ai adoption to generally help building a digitally inclusive society a socially inclusive society can you tell us how it has been boosting gdp growth how can we use it to revive our economy so i was mentioning about how we have potential of ai in agriculture if we are able to really leverage the ai technology then it will help us to improve farmer incomes which will add to the gdp it will help us to deliver quality education it will help us to improve the learning outcomes so if we look from a technology point of view the idea is how we can use technology for you for ease of doing business ease of living and ease of gov governance all this will add to the gdp of the country it will the ai technologies will be creating new job opportunities and at the same uh, so we we can use ai technology to develop the solution at the same time we can use to enhance the skills so we have more than 4000 startup in the education sector and they cut across various segments like k12 space entrance exam higher education and lifelong learning 
if we are able to leverage this technology then we can enhance the skills and the knowledge of citizens and productive uh, citizen will definitely add to the gdp so technology is the enabler it it can enable use cases in various sectors it can enables the skill set and knowledge of citizens and once we have enabled that ecosystem all this moving part will come together and that will add to the gdp of the country so as we wrap this discussion i want to just have a futuristic look uh, so tell me in the next 5 years what service is going to become ubiquitous absolutely mainstream something like you know online shopping is today with the, due to the help with the aid of say artificial intelligence as well as machine learning uh, venkat would you like to uh, go at it first Sure, you know. So I'm going to be a little bold here, since uh, you wanted me to be futuristic. So autonomous driving is going to be the mainstream in the next eight years or so in India. Yeah. When I say autonomous driving, it doesn't have to be totally driverless driving of a particular car or something, right? It has. It can be like at various levels, like L1, L2, L3, L4. There are various levels where the AI can help the driver. Uh, with multiple things like lane discipline to accident avoidance etc and it's going to change the way people drive it's going to be extremely helpful for people who are physically challenged so this is going to change the way the roads are as you see today you know okay uh, kumar you had earlier referred to how your fridge your smart fridge perhaps can speak to your kirana and then automatically refill itself uh, so that you know ecosystem perhaps is going to be in place but your thoughts in the next 5 years yeah i'll, I'll also have to, yeah i'll also try and be bold here i think that's the only way to do this uh, two parts i think as consumers uh, it's about what the customer wants when they want where they want is going to be the norm rather than an exception and that customers are going to demand that they need what they want at the time that they want and as retailers they love to be ready for that there's no other way and and you don't have an excuse of tell, telling that there is no technology available i think this also goes on to the governments i think we don't really go deep into that part for example why should we be facing bad air why should we be able to be in a stuck in traffic now why should our our various returns not get done on time i think all this will get much easier and smoother as the government starts adopting ai much more and as as citizens i'll think that way of life is going to change for all of us as government start adopting ai and better technologies that's where things are going to go i've seen this happen in other parts of the world one of the most traffic ridden cities where alibaba was got changed into one of the most smooth drives ever and this is the kind of thing that can happen thanks to ai and we can expect that to happen when governments come into the picture so at an individual level speed of thought at, at an institutional level the government will change the way we live and the way we experience life okay it can happen let's hope let's hope that it does happen uh, but um, kuren you've got the last word on this i'm going to, i'm going to say smart manufacturing and let me and, and let me elaborate on that today manpower is a big value addition that comes out of a lot of the developing economies um as we progress down the down the train of smart manufacturing manpower is going to be required for a certain set of tasks and all of the repetitive tasks can be done by machines highly accurately and probably more accurately than manpower what that's going to do is it's going to reduce the cost of commodities it's going to change the way we see the world it's going to change the way commodities are are brought out it's going to improve design it's going to improve method of of uh, production and it's going to reduce supply chain costs uh, dry, uh, and net net drive down uh, drive down the uh, drive down all our costs of living so I, i think smart manufacturing is the next big wave that we will that we will see have big impact on our lives so what would be the big bold bet that you would uh, make according to me the ai and blockchain use cases will get mainstream in next 5 years we will be seeing the democratizing of these technology personalized learning personalized advisory in agriculture predictive medicine 
will be the futuristic technologies we would be seeing uh, pan india adoption of these technologies at the same time from a government point of view we need to uh, ensure that how do we support these technologies uh, so we need to focus on digital infrastructure we need to ensure that we have well connected digitally connected hospitals schools and farms we need to focus on digital literacy and we need to focus on data protection and privacy these are the three ecosystem blocks where government uh, government institute should focus on okay gentlemen thank you very much for that technology has indeed been a critical driver for so many sectors across enterprises as well as at the government level we've seen an uptick in uh, you know applications with the use of ai and ml intelligent devices smart manufacturing is on the rise and of course we've got a surge in data centric innovations as well this has been the most insightful uh, conversation thank you once again for joining us Hello and welcome to AI and Cloud Summit, a virtual summit in collaboration with Dell Technologies and Tata Tele Business Services, focusing on the role of disruptive technologies like AI and cloud and the limitless possibilities for business. We're bringing together the industry stalwarts and technology leaders to uncover cloud capabilities that fuel operational efficiency, especially when combined with the power of AI and big data. The topic for today's session is cloud services catalyzing change and inciting business innovation. joining my esteemed panelists rama devi lanka the director of emerging technologies at telangana uh, mr anjani kumar the cio at strides pharma mr mohit arora the senior director commercial business at vmware and mr aditya kendra the vice president sme operations tata tele business services and i am reema tendulkar from cnbc tv 18 ladies and gentlemen it's a pleasure having you here with us and thank you so much for joining in Uh, Mohit, uh, starting the discussion with you, we have seen enterprises embrace cloud in a very big way, and COVID has only accelerated this adoption. Can you share your thoughts on what we are seeing right now? Thanks, Reema. So, cloud definitely has been, uh, you know, something which is adopted very fast nowadays by all IT architects, and uh, we've seen enterprises uh, leveraging the power of cloud. especially in the digital transformation journey that they have embarked upon and i would say covid has been one of the accelerators for digital transformation so uh, having limited uh, you know access to uh, data centers limited access to uh, deliveries of hardware being questioned and things like that people have started looking at cloud as a serious option for expanding their footprint the new workloads are being low, you know taken on cloud and people are also moving towards new modern apps which work very well on cloud because of the scalability the kind of agility they get so cloud definitely is becoming more and more uh, you know important and uh, a serious uh, component of it architecture as we go forward absolutely cloud has become the backbone of uh, you know so many operations at companies uh, mr uh, you know anjani pharmaceutical companies have been in the spotlight like never before in the last 1 to 2 years vaccine production which used to take what you know 10 to 12 years has now been done in under 1 year and technology is very central to every pharmaceutical company and the industry itself can you tell us why you know pharma companies need to adopt cloud right now and what is it that we are currently seeing thank you reema if you ask me the cloud technology has been the biggest biggest constructive destruction of the technology industry and anywhere if you, you will have to look at when you are talking of cloud you'll have to look at what exactly it gives to the business in terms of business so biggest thing it gives you the agility you talked about vaccine being uh, coming to the market within one year which used to take 8 to 12 years one of the uh, constraint has been getting the hardware getting the data layer now with cloud coming in within few hours you could get how much data you want how much compute power you want how much hard drive you want all of this is enabled using the cloud this second part which is the elasticity so a lot of month end processes especially in pharma companies 
goes slows go uh, i mean you know it gets slower and one of the reason is the computing capacity using cloud you get the computing capacity the third one which i think um, mohit talked about a little bit he said when the covid came most of the pharma manufacturing company also faced the same problem which other manufacturing companies faced and that is how do you enable remote working how do you enable working with lesser number of people and when it comes to this be it vdi which is virtual desktop interface or be it enabling the iot uh, enabled devices being the making the lab digital and virtual cloud enables us to do it much faster and much easier way and that is where i mean if you look at pharma has been traditionally been laggard in the digital transformation but last 2 to 3 years has been the golden era of the pharma uh, pharma and uh, life sciences industry cloud has in cloud adoption is one of the basic thing which has adopted that is as a serious option and that's where the whole uh, cloud is necessary one infra two data and three the tools which will make you agile constructive disruptor i like uh, the term that you've coined uh, for cloud and the impact that it's have um, you know rama devi uh, ma'am you've been pioneering the use of innovative technology to bring about change at the government level so you have projects like sagubanu where you promote innovation in agriculture horticulture you have arogya shri for uh, people below the poverty line and you know many of your projects and initiatives are housed on cloud has cloud become ubiquitous and how would you compare where india stands vis-a-vis -vis other countries especially the developed countries like us as well as europe yeah thank you reema for having me on the panel uh, well if you look at various government departments both at the center and in the states many have started their digital transformation journey you know so uh, now for india it becomes even more evident that cloud becomes an imperative you know for government especially to improve service delivery to citizens and second business uh, and uh, the other one is to improve governance you know so but i would say that three broad drivers or the key drivers uh, for adoption of cloud one is we have a very young demographic population uh in india you know who grew up digital like young people like you you know so how do how does the government deliver services to this young generation you know uh, that can like it has to be very easy to use very quick enhanced user experience you know even if the screen slows down for a microseconds they become very impatient so one is we have a young demographic population who grew up on digital second as um, earlier somebody has said you know the pandemic has actually accelerated the adoption of digital services be it in healthcare education we are having online classes of course we are now opening up the schools online payments have increased and even in the government we have been working from home you know we have this electronic office use of emails have increased so this increase in usage of online services necessitates the use of cloud for government so and as you know you know the size and scale in the government is huge If, especially when you're talking about these healthcare services or online classes you know so you're talking about millions of users so what's the best way to scale up obviously it's the cloud you know that is the second one pandemic third as you earlier mentioned that you know i uh, work on emerging technologies very exciting projects that we are implementing in telangana using various technologies like blockchain ai ml drones iot and so on so these are all new age technologies you know so uh, we can access variety of uh, what you call these services ranging from compute storage you know iot ai machine learning and so on as a service it's we don't you don't have to really procure all the uh, you know software licenses and keep it with you because these are evolving technologies and you don't have to uh, have long term contracts and zero upfront cross and pay as you go pricing so uh, so uh, you know this is actually the ease of access to these services with no upfront cost for us you know for the government initially uh, helps us to experiment these new technologies kind of faster proof of concepts and so on you know so these new technologies the emerging technologies necessitates the adoption of cloud so well the conclusion is today cloud is a key fulcrum you know that helps the governments to accelerate their digital transformation journey which again ultimately enables to deliver services faster 
enhancing ease of use at a very reasonable cost to a large number of citizens in a seamless way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right, key fulcrum, cloud brings in agility, elasticity, scalability. Uh, I think the whole pricing model also, you said, helps in, uh, you know, bringing in the adoption. Uh, Aditya, would you like to share, uh, you know, some of the value that you've generated at Data Tele from cloud platforms and how it's helped you as well as your clients propel growth? I uh, see, for me, cloud is the 10th planet. Uh, we really want to, and ma'am was just talking about uh, the projects which the government is taking. And uh, my understanding is that the role of the government, any government, is to, you know, uh, for any technology, if you're talking about technology, technology to reach even the last consumer wherever he is across the country. And if you really want to democratize technology, uh, that's what cloud is for. It's the planet with endless possibilities. There are existing models. We talk about, you know, Amazon, Flipkart, Tata Clicks. These are models which are not new. These are models which are already prevalent somewhere in the offline mode earlier. They've just been bought online and they've got some vast possibilities to expand to. And then there are, you know, the inventions which we're talking about, which is the Netflix, <clears throat> which is the, you know, uh, Instagram, the Facebook. So these are the new inventions which are coming up on the, on the cloud platforms. I come from a business background, you know, a business is all about a consumer and a manufacturer. You may have the best of the product in the market, but if you don't have the consumer in front of you, the product has got no value. What cloud is bringing across on, on the table is these 7 million consumers, right? Now you need to have the product, the consumer is there. If you look at from any of, any of our clients angle or you know, the companies who are using it, they're able to derive that value by getting the access to the consumer. And the most important part, secondly, is the cost efficiency, which, can, you know, which cloud brings on the platform. Today, building an offline platform is expensive, not just expensive, it's very, very expensive, which, which is where the where, where cloud plays on a cost efficiency role. And third, you know, every company itself is also a consumer. And when company buys and or goes for the, you know, the cloud integration or the technology platforms, what it gets is revolutionizing the change from employee thinking behavior to, you know, these are the three things which I, I personally believe that uh, where, where customers and consumers are deriving advantage out of. Mm. Uh, you know, I track uh, IT companies and the listed players very closely. And I remember Rajesh Gopinathan of CEO saying always that, you know, this whole cloud is a three phase or a three horizon. Uh, you should look at it in three horizons. So the first horizon is pure migration, the adoption. But the second horizon is when customers start to leverage the capabilities of cloud around analytics, artificial intelligence and machine learnings to, you know, build customized uh, solutions, to, you know, to grow and transform their business. And horizon three is when you can find a completely different new avenue, you know, a new business avenue uh, has opened up for you uh, based on these uh, cloud capabilities. Um, so, you know, at the moment, it appears that, you know, we are at horizon one where we've seen increased adoption of cloud services. Um, and Jani, you indicated that, you know, pharmaceutical sector was a laggard when it came to adoption, but now you are seeing increased adoption. Can you talk about this horizon too, when uh, we are seeing companies like yours leverage the capabilities of cloud surrounding analytics, artificial intelligence, machine learning to drive these customized solutions? Sure. So, uh, I mean, I talked about why cloud. One is, uh, I mean, Two, three reasons we talked about and now now you talked about three horizons so first one is the infra infra part the second part comes as a platform as a service and the third part comes as a, in the in the platform itself data as a service and tools so a lot of business cases like aditya talked about cost benefits of cloud actually if you look at from the cio's perspective cloud is not always cheap it depends on your use cases. If you take startups or some of our application, cloud is cheap, but in many cases we don't find it. But then there is a different advantage and that is what even you are talking of second horizon. It gives you tools. It gives you the technology, which if you want to try on yourself without cloud, it will take years to do it. Whereas here you could do is in days, months, 
and to come uh, come to this like when you do digitization the next step comes what do you do with that data and that is where this second horizon comes into play we call it after all this digitization data never sleeps okay that's inspired by city never sleeps from the city bank and what it gives it gives you what do you do with the data the whole data layer concept if i try to do the data layer concept in my traditional data uh, in premise or co located data warehouses it will take years today i can go to aws i could could go to google i could go to microsoft data lake data warehouse within a year most of the organization will be able to do at least 70 to 80% of the data lake data warehouse create a data layer out of it even ai ml if i want to do ai ml putting a platform in house it will take years and years but here if i use google tensor flow or the microsoft cognitive layers or the amazon ai uh, layers any of those could take me few weeks and in pharma there is a lot of use one you have already seen the r and d where you you talked about the uh, vaccine production second one is the clinical trial how do you figure out who are the right patients who will be eligible for this and using analytics it can cut months then using ai when you do the clinical trials how do you comparison results compare results not only us even the regulatory agency like fda is already using ai ml to get to verify the submissions done by the pharmaceutical companies in manufacturing we have predictive analytics we have golden batches where you could right away figure out whether you are going towards the threshold exceptions and you could control your processes in quality uh, you what you could do is you could read all the root causes using nlps and uh, what is not possible humanly you could do through the systems and sometimes we see what has been done by the human the system adds much more value on top of it so there are several use cases which is being done and that's like the second layer and most of these which i talked about is partially or fully enabled by the cloud and the last one but not the least is the edge computing which is the biggest buzzword i'm sure you would have heard and with the edge computing and cloud coming together how much you do on the edge devices and how much you uh, for what you go to cloud you could do visual inspections of the tablet which you manufacture uh, each of them could be inspected previously it was done only through sampling so only few of them do now you could do each of them so this is there is a immense potential an immense implementation which is going through in the in the second uh, horizon you talked about absolutely uh, you know the endless possibilities uh, from technologies like edge computing which bring down latency to such an extent it's going to be fascinating uh, the next few years we've already taken such big strides uh, i don't even know in, in what leaps and bounds uh, the next few years hold in terms of the development that take place so we have in a way illustrated the benefit of cloud and why every company and enterprise or even a government needs to look at it uh you know very very closely now i want to you know move on to the next topic because organizations also find it challenging to you know find the best suited cloud solutions for their business needs and who would be the right service provider to guide them in their cloud transformation strategy so here mohit if you could share your thoughts um how does a company go around uh, you know finding their cloud strategy what is the difference between a hybrid cloud strategy what exactly is a multi cloud strategy which one is best suited for who very relevant question reema so uh, this cloud thing is not new as i said earlier uh, if you look at uh, you know companies who have been in in the business of providing it infrastructure modernizing it infrastructure there has been a concept uh, called private cloud so we we actually came up with tools and technology which could help our customers use their on prem infrastructure like a cloud for a very long time and that has been something which is very prevalent in all enterprise customers may it be banking telecom or manufacturing you would see most of the you know data centers are today modernized uh, we call a concept called software defined data center wherein whether compute storage network security everything is defined through a software layer you automate as much as you can and you consume your own it infrastructure like a cloud so this has been going on for last 5 6 years but now that uh, we have options of moving to public cloud or so called hyperscalers 
uh, available you know and multiple choices are also available there uh, people uh, or rather the enterprises have to make a choice and the choice has to be between which workload is suitable to run on prem and which one should go on cloud and that is a biggest you know strategy decision that the companies take for example say if you are running a core you know application like an erp or you are running running say for a bank it's a core banking application or core insurance applications would you be willing to put that on cloud still the answer you would get from 9 out of 10 customers would be that no we would want to run it on cloud on on prime on prem rather on your own you know data center or co located data center but when you look at peripheral applications say like crm hcm or say social media related applications uh, the first answer would be why not try cloud first so those applications people would want to put on cloud again uh, there the, while it is easier said and done that uh, okay you want to pick up application and take to cloud uh, it takes a lot of planning it takes a lot of uh, you know uh, strategy change or it takes a lot of even ch technology change to move something straight from you know on prem to cloud or you know make it run in the cloud uh, the process is called redesigning refactoring or sometimes recoding the application so companies like vmware in fact vmware is a pioneer in this space uh, we came up with this idea that okay we will partner with these hyperscalers to provide you a platform which is uniform across your on prem and cloud which essentially means that if you are running say an application today in your own premise in your own data center and you believe this application is a good workload for cloud and you don't want to wait for the time it will take to refactor or redesign this application and you want to just lift and shift it to the cloud it is very much possible today it is as as good as you know moving a workload from one server to another server using v motion kind of a thing which we have been talking about for a long time so picking up copying a workload pasting it say in aws taking it to google taking it to oracle taking it to you know any other hyperscaler Uh, we have got that you know passage defined for our customers the other way of looking at uh, you know harnessing the power of application or a power of cloud is like uh, anjani sir was mentioning that uh, it's not just about you know running it in cloud but making or making use of the tools that are available there making use of so many other things that you can do like ai and so many other things which is possible if your applications are modernized so that is another concept which is happening where people are coming up with you know, new applications which are born in cloud which are developed on the technologies like containers kubernetes etc and then they take it to the cloud or some customers we have seen some enterprises we have seen who are looking at the concept of microservices from a legacy application bring out certain services build them as microservices and run them on cloud so there is one no one answer for all types of workloads hybrid cloud is the first thing that people started doing some time back from private cloud to you know one cloud but then one cloud is not sufficient today uh, earlier we used to say every enterprise would have at least one cloud but today in the western world you see at least three clouds so most of the enterprises are working on three clouds so now this is a question of moving workloads from one cloud to another cloud which is basically multi cloud and managing it through a single pane of glass and that's where you know we have some specific offerings which allow our customers not just to manage what they are running on prem but also what they are running on multiple clouds with a single pane of glass because that's most critical right now and this is going to you know come up people will have some applications which are saas based applications which are already running on cloud people would push some applications to say google cloud other application may move to aws cloud so there will be heterogeneity around around your you know platforms but then again the key would be how do you manage security on this on this kind of platforms how would you manage the uniformity and above all how would you also manage the cost of running these you know workloads on different clouds so that is where technology plays a very important role and there are new tools new you know software products which are available which help customers to plan these things and then plan not just plan but also run and manage these things across multiple clouds so that's that's the story which we are talking to most of the customers and we are seeing that a lot of demand for those tools which will be used to manage clouds now actually uh, just one follow up question uh, mohit uh, is there any downside of using or uh, you know having a multi cloud uh, strategy you spoke about security to you know you have to ensure uniformity as well uh so you know how difficult is that to achieve and also if you could just throw in you know some thoughts on the entire cost structure 
that uh, this transformation to cloud, this cloud adoption entails? So part one of your question, security. So security definitely is the most critical aspect of any IT architecture today. And we've all heard about uh, so many so many security breaches that have happened in the last one year. In fact, there is some 93% increase in the number of ransomware attacks which has happened in the last six months. So we're all wary of that. We're all worried that uh, our architecture should be foolproof and we should have uniform security you know policies which move along with workloads whether they run on prem or cloud a or cloud b so there are there are you know uh, ways of doing that there are there are tools available today which help you take the security of a workload along with it to whichever cloud you want to run to so that's another that is a very important aspect while you know thinking about an architecture which will harness multiple clouds uh, and and security is also changing very fast so it should not be that uh, it, it takes time to make those changes it has to be you know at the at the speed at which uh, the, the bad guys are moving so you need to make changes you need to patch your uh, you know software system software you need to be ready those things we need to do and there is something like like you know a lot latest technologies which are coming which is next gen and you know agentless kind of security wherein you don't have too many security tools also because if you have too many of them then you are always worried about which one is ready which one is giving false alarms which one is giving the right alarm so how do you consolidate your security posture is also very important now coming to cost part of it so uh, like madam had touched this part, point that uh, it is easy to move to cloud because you don't have initial investment but again there is always you know uh, there's always a scale at which you will go and there'll be always a, a unpredictability of cost in case you are not very clear how you're going to scale up how agile infrastructure you'll be consuming at what speed your consumption is going to be so there are ways and means to monitor that so we we have a, a solution which we call as cloud health by vmware so which essentially helps customers to identify that which workload is running on which cloud and what is the cost we are incurring and it goes to the extent of you know giving suggestions in terms of if it is refactored if it is moved to a different cloud and how do you optimize costs of running your cloud infrastructure or multi cloud infrastructure so there are tools available today and which uh, you know large enterprises are leveraging to manage cost but yes managing cost is something which is a very important subject when it comes to running it on um, you know hyper hybrid cloud or multi cloud environments just to get a more uh, round, you know rounded uh, output on uh, you know thoughts on this particular topic aditya if you would like to share what were your key considerations when you formulated the cloud strategy how did you go about it you know uh, we were just talking about the cost part of it and it, it's quite debatable that what kind of efficiencies any organization looks at but i i quite agree with mohit on the fact that uh, verticalization plays a very very important role when when we talk about a strategy for cloud it really depends whether you're from banking whether you're from it as it what vertical are you looking at you know some companies or some verticals will obviously not let their uh, you know uh, database or let their whatever information they have go to the private or the, or the public cloud so easily from a security concern but then there are other companies who may feel that you know a public and a private cloud combination is very necessary because it has got its own advantages there specifically an advantage if i talk about you know which comes from not just the, the cost part of this but also i think anjali touched about is the time and speed part of it that plays a very very important role what application you want to do it really fast what application you feel is you know from the security threat is more second is you know um, today organizations the way they are going collaboration is playing a very very important role you know you need to collaborate to be more successful something you don't need to innovate you just have you know there are th people companies what he done it so cloud can, you know get that strategy of public and private also comes into the picture how much you want to collaborate with which company and what is the strategy and it helps you in specifically in the function of marketing you know when you market your products that's where the second advantage comes and third is also i think one of the things which we sometimes miss across is whenever we talk about efficiencies or at least i we looked at it in our clients there are a lot of hidden cost efficiencies which come into picture when a lot of internal applications of consumers uh, and you know they move on to a private to a public cloud it's easier for the organization to take some larger decisions you know if, one of the things which we've been um, looking at many of our clients moving on is it is from loop, move, leaving their own offices and moving into a co-work space 
that's only been possible because they have been able to shift their own infra from you know internal private cloud to either hybrid model or to a public cloud aspect yeah. fair enough uh, interesting um Rama ma'am, uh, the gen you know, since we are on the subject of cost, and you know, some of the speakers already outlined their thoughts on that. You know, the general perception would be that you know the government would maybe have outdated a technology environment. They would be a lot more cost conscious. So, can you talk about your thoughts on how to approach cloud versus cost? Because even making that transformation is expensive. It is that initial investment that you have to put in. Uh, sure, Rima. Yeah. Uh, well, that's a very important question. Uh, you know, when we actually uh, deal with cloud, uh, you know, while in the beginning I said that there is no initial cost. You know, that it's like um, you start small and scale it up as you go. Uh, and moreover, in the government, you know, for years we have been used to a particular model wherein. It's a fixed kind of payments that we do to service providers. Like we estimate the entire cost of the infrastructure for the next five years of contract period, five, three, whatever it is, you know, and then uh, divide the entire amount into you know quarterly payments or something and pay it to the. That's the kind of, and you actually estimate the entire infrastructure requirements that are required for a period of five years. So that's uh, the way we used to do in the you know in the conventional infrastructure, but now. You don't need to do that guesstimate, you know. We call it a guesstimate rather than an estimate because earlier we used to guess how much infrastructure we required for the next five. Despite that, despite that, you know, you, you might be you might have read in papers, you know, when uh, during these results, either M set or tenth uh, results, the servers crash. You know, that's the kind of scenario sometimes, you know, that we look at the government. So with cloud, you know, uh, uh, while we don't have to now guess estimate you just start small with the minimum basic requirements that you're going to you know estimate and just scale it up you know and you're going to pay as you consume earlier uh, you know there's a study by i think mckenzie in uh, in association with uptime i think what they said 50 to 60 percent of the uh, infrastructure capacity with state data centers remains idle they're not utilized so there itself you're seeing huge wastage of cost you know while we are buying infrastructure that is unused so with cloud we can actually bring down that cost of your you know uh, uh, infrastructure that we're actually putting in that that could be a major uh, you know uh, advantage and the other one as you mentioned in the beginning that we have actually moved our uh, legacy system of rup tree and uh, you know greater hyderabad municipal corporation to the cloud it just happened a couple of months back while it was a kind of a lift and shift, but initially we could save around 30 to 40 percent of the total cost, estimated cost, you know, by optimizing resources, by, uh, you know, designing the right sizing uh, and storage. Initially, they estimated some 40 terabytes of storage is required. But as we carried out, you know, uh, more uh, like you call due diligence, we realized only three terabytes of data is actively being used. The rest of it can be moved to. Uh, other storage devices, you know. So uh, in this way, cost optimization can be carried out. But for government, well, cost is a consideration. But more than the cost, we are looking at agility, you know, operational agility. Like in government, you know, suddenly we announce a new scheme, right, uh, which has to be delivered to the citizens. Then for that, you know, cloud really helps us in, you know, uh, uh, reducing the turnover time quickly. You know, you have. Uh, like you can either go for infrastructure as a service or platform as a service or even, you know, for new technologies like machine learning, you can use software as a service. So in that case, you can just, you know, develop the application and host it on cloud. You don't need to buy infrastructure and all. So more than, as I said, while cost is definitely a consideration, the operational agility, the elasticity, the reliability, these are the things that the government is looking at cloud. And one important that I would like to share is uh, security is a big concern for government when it comes to cloud while all of us know that you know sometimes cloud i mean cloud is more secure than on-prem devices but still that concern is still there with the government departments we are trying to conduct workshops and you know uh, bringing in awareness saying that you know security is a shared responsibility and cloud is in fact more secure than you know sometimes on-prem uh, uh, you know uh, infrastructure yeah 
Uh, so, ma'am, you said that, you know, on your projects like Arogya Shri, the Greater Hyderabad, the Municipal Corp, uh, by using cloud and uh, it brought about efficient use of your capacity because of which you could save about 30 to 40 percent of your storage costs. So on these particular projects, have you used any tools like, say, artificial intelligence or any other? And also, if you could illustrate the kind of you know, value added benefits that you've managed to extract. Well, Rima, for the Aurigishri and uh, Greater GHMC, we call it, Greater Hyderabad Municipal Corporation, they are the legacy systems, you know, that we have just uh, moved to cloud. But as I said, in the Emerging Technologies Division, we are in fact working on various projects uh, in technologies like uh, blockchain, machine learning, you know. Uh, one interesting project that I'll share with you is the pension life cycle management project. You, uh, you might be aware that a retired person will have to produce a certificate saying that he's alive, you know. Uh, so what we did, and I mean, very citizens, senior citizens, they really have to go to government office or to your bank, you know, to produce that certificate. So what we did, uh, you know, we actually developed a smartphone based application where you just need to take a photograph, you know, it's facial uh, uh, recognition technology we have used. It's again, we haven't, uh, we, this is on cloud, you know, we did not procure any uh, software license. Of course, it's actually pay as use. So we have uh, used machine learning, uh, deep learning technologies to identify if suppose, Rima, you are applying for this pension. Of course, you are not retired yet. But, you know, to identify if Rima is a you know, uh, real person who is actually availing the services. It actually compares your picture with the picture in the database and uh, gives a certificate that, yes, this particular person is alive and he or she can be, uh, you know, sanctioned pension. So, yeah, this is one very interesting project where we are using machine learning and deep learning technology. I hope this will not because I know so many senior citizens going every, you know, at the start of every month to the bank, waiting in the long queues of the PSU banks to try and get that pension certificate. Absolutely. Going for that, you know, hey, we are alive and, you know, we need that uh, pension. So I hope, uh, you know, this does become, uh, you know, fairly ubiquitous since we are on the subject of these uh, you know these tools plus cloud which can have this transformational effect let me move on to a uh, big data and cloud you know if big data does mean that there is going to be a lot of data and cloud in a way will help you um, you know scale it up uh, so you can run data intensive applications on uh, cloud um, so you know mr kumar uh, you know in you know for the pharmaceutical company for your company you all are generating a lot of data as you pointed out uh, have you been complementing big data with cloud? So before I go to uh, Rima, before I go to this question, I mean, first of all, I would want to give kudos to uh, Rama, uh, what she explained, taking care of millennials, senior citizens, okay. using the technology, uh, a government person, I must give her kudos and congratulations to her. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> The second part, I mean, before I again go to the question, we were talking about cost of the cloud. I would want to narrate a smaller story. So five years back, I was working as a CIO and I wanted to bring five years back. Cloud was very nascent, wanted to do it for a backup. So I had discussion with CFO and CFO said, look, we are in an industry which is a very capital in intensive. We create. So why do you want to bring cloud? It's very expensive. We had 11 TB of data to be backed, and I showed him the cost. It was $110 at that time per month. I said, even if you buy hard disk, this will be much more expensive, correct? And this is six years back, the cost has gone down. So this is the, I mean, just, just an illustration uh, on, the, on the cost part, correct? Mm -hmm. Now coming to the original question which you had is, uh, how do we use big data? Now. One of the biggest use for, if you ask me, the, one of the biggest use of cloud is the, how do you store the data? How do you create a data layer? How do you bring data democratization? And demo, data democratization does not mean somebody asked me in my organization jokingly, does data democratization mean that whatever data we want to keep only we will keep it? The answer is not. The data democratization means if I am authorized to use the data, I should be able to use in the format which I want, and in the way I want to visualize the data, correct? So we are, I mean, right from the uh, R&D data, which is a huge data, R&D data, clinical trial data, which is a huge data, and you want this to be available anywhere, especially after COVID, one of the 
initiative, which is future of work in many organizations. One of the initiative, one of the ask is, can I give a virtual working option? Until unless you have the right uh, enablement through the cloud, it's very difficult that data can be seen anywhere. So that itself, it enables. Two, the data growth. I mean, if you look at any organization, last two years, 80% of the data has been generated in last two to three years. Great. Gartner talked about there will be 20 billion devices by 2020. And we laughed. Today we have we are at 21 point something billion devices, IoT devices, and they all are generating data every second. Where do you yeah. keep it? Historian databases, which is in manufacturing execution system. How do you store that data? That's a um, big data and unstructured data, correct? So all of these is being stored in the data warehouse. Again, multi, you, you don't store, you don't have one solution fits all. So you have to look at which kind of data, which cloud is one beneficial, two from the availability perspective, three, what are the tools, how you will use, right? So that's one from the R&D perspective, manufacturing the same, same goals, like you have manufacturing execution system, predictive analytics, how do you store that? Quality, I mean, we are a very compliance driven industry, right? And one of the reasons why cloud was not there was a compliance. Now compliance is being powered with the power of digital, and that is where you store all the data. Great. The last part, which many of you would have read, uh, that supply chain is a challenge. API, pharma companies are not getting API, Remdesivir, all of this use. So we call it, how do you bring resiliency in the supply chain? So you use external data, you use internal data, and make sure that you bring re resiliency to the supply chain. You create a digital control tower using the forecast, using the supply, and what you are consuming on the manufacturing flow, what your customer is needed when. And especially during the COVID time, it was very, I mean, first time we realized that it is even more important than we think. And that's where we use a lot of data analytics and power of data layer, data democratization right out on the cloud. Uh, hey, fascinating, interesting. Um, you know, so that's about uh, perhaps uh, big data. Aditi, if you would like to add anything on it, and I also then later wanted to get your thoughts in on this personalization aspect, but anything that you wanted to add on uh, big data and cloud? Well, I think uh, the, uh, my counterparts have explained it very well, and I'm, you know, uh, you know I'm actually put it rightly that the way we are democratizing technology and we always talk about democratizing technology for you know businesses to do big right and i think government is uh, totally capitalizing on it and uh, it's nice to hear that what the government is doing and trying to reach the last consumer it's only when we are able to make technology use you know capitalize on technology and make uh, every consumer and every citizen benefited out of it is that we'll be successful as a country Right. And I think uh, we are on the right path. Uh, just that um, in doing so, looking at, you know, we, talk, we today talked about the efficiency part of it. You know, we've uh, talked about uh, how consumer is part of it. I think uh, initially, Anjani talked, uh, or Mohit talked about, you know, that uh, the three steps have to be now adapted. And most of the organizations are on the step one. It's not just the pharma companies. I think most of the organizations today are on step one. It's time that everybody recognizes that it's now time to move to step two, right? And then uh, to the last step, because it's a cultural change which all of us have to bring into, right? Uh, the cultural change uh, because of lack of technology is more like a clockwork culture where the central person generally, you know, puts up what to do and the rest of the organization or rest of the business will follow it. I think from that uh, clockwork culture, the uh, cloud or big data is helping us to move to a more of a uh, networking and uh, arena culture. And I think uh, if we are able to capitalize on that networking and arena culture, uh, we are there. Mm -hmm. Well, it's uh, culture as well as uh, we need to close the technology skill gap as well uh, going ahead. But Aditya, um, you know, automation was yesterday's story. Today's and tomorrow's story is going to be about personalization. You spoke about technology reaching the last consumer. Uh, can you talk about enterprises developing business models which use cloud capabilities to create hyper-targeted customer offerings? Yes, yeah, so see, uh, 
if you look at uh, I, you know every enterprise today earlier we used to uh, differentiate enterprise more from a vertical angle and that's what technology adoption is as today uh, dependent on which vertical you know we talked about i think anjali and me talked about what vertical you are into that's how the adoption is coming but now it's not about any more just about the verticalization part of it you know uh, it's about the business model you want to adopt and uh, and adapting that business model you are moving to the next level you know government is the right example we we were looking at one part of the shop doing it in a particular way now that particular example is sets up that you can do the same thing in five or six different ways and that's what you know big data is all about if it uh, look at you know i i, I just want to give an example there i was just sitting in one of the co-op for a week back and uh, the place where i was sitting there were three or three gentlemen and a lady sitting just next to me and talking about uh, a large brand in making and i just happened to talk to them you know what are you guys doing and they responded back uh, that they've come up and uh, they built up an online platform and they are trying to compete with the biggest brands in the world three people just sitting on right side to me were talking about some technological solution saas based platform which they have developed so uh, big data and technology is not just about the larger companies taking it to the next level it's also about you know the smaller entrepreneurs coming up and uh, building it up Okay, uh, Mohit, uh, coming to the close of this discussion, you know, as you, we've all been saying, the cloud adoption isn't the goal here. It's not the real price. The real objective is how you use cloud to the fullest extent in supporting digital innovations. Could you share your final thoughts on this particular topic? Sure. Uh, see, cloud or no cloud, basically, uh, you know, the decision is, as I said, depending on. suitable suitability of the workload so again enterprises are in different you know phases of their journey towards this transformation uh, there are saas based application the use of cloud could be for platform as a service or infrastructure as a service there are so many flavors of cloud also available today and uh, again uh, maturity of the customers applications which will run which which can run on cloud as is which need to be rewritten obviously to be resized refactored so there are various aspects what one has to look at from the enterprise perspective before deciding that what would be the right platform to run their applications but the key is that uh, today the options the, the 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 variety of things that you can do with cloud uh, is amazing and uh, like whether it is to do with the, the tools that are available the agility the scalability and obviously we spoke about uh you know various use cases one of the best use case maybe governments are now looking at is uh, dr as a service so today you have a setup which you are running in your cloud in, in your on prem premise on uh, on your own data center tomorrow when you are thinking of setting up a dr site do i really need to do the same nine yards of you know evaluation and then putting up the infrastructure data center everything again or can i just make my dr available on a cloud so that's a very good use case so so many things you can do so many possibilities that you have with cloud so only thing is we need to have a clear strategy as to where and how we have to move towards it okay and uh, last question ladies must have the last word uh, so rama this one is for you uh, to utilize the benefits of cloud computing the government of india has embarked on the uh, ambitious gi cloud initiative uh, megraj how far this initiative according to you is beneficial for the government at large and businesses in particular yeah rima i'm glad that you have asked this question because you know uh, i have been part of this megraj initiative in uh, you know which was initial initiated in the year 2014 i think so i actually was involved in developing the procurement guidelines or you know cloud procurement gui guidelines and uh, designed master uh, master service agreement you know it's called sla which today gem you know government e marketplace is, has adopted the same so i'm really happy to <laughs> share that you know well uh, this megraj initiative is a very visionary initiative at that point of time because it as i said it has been initiated in 2014 when governments had no clue about cloud but this initiative kind of set, uh, it set the momentum for cloud adoption of cloud you know no department started looking at cloud and how now today there are many government uh, state governments in fact because of megraj you know two states initially first maharashtra has come out with a government order 
mandating all the departments to go for cloud. And we in Telangana, last year, we have come out with a uh, government order saying that all the government departments should move to cloud. Of course, you know, uh, not just like, uh, I mean, we also indicated certain scenarios where they should move to cloud. Like, you know, you just can't move to cloud on day one, right? So when your contract is expiring, when your infrastructure needs refurbishment or becoming obsolete, or you need some capacity enhancement and so on, you know. So that's the government order that we have come out with. But one key differentiator uh, is that we have actually come out with a cloud strategy, cloud adoption framework for the government, you know. So uh, like, uh, you know, how do they need to actually rethink on uh, budgeting, as I said, you know, how do you budget? Because it's a whole lot of different, uh, you know, way of procurement of cloud as it's pay, pay as you go and so on, right? And how do you evaluate as someone was saying, you know, how, like uh, if you need to buy a cloud service, it's a service now, it's no longer infrastructure. So how do you evaluate, you know, the financials of uh, procurement of cloud as a service? So we have put all together in this framework document and really departments are now actually at least, you know, looking at cloud and uh, trying to adopt cloud. And as, as I said earlier, two major departments actually, you know, their workloads have been moved to cloud. And we have learned a lot in those, you know, uh, in migrations, which we are actually use, preparing case studies so that we can actually use it for other departments. And lastly, we have set up a center of excellence in cloud in partnership with Hyderabad Software, uh, you know, uh, Exporters Association, HICIA. So this COE will work with all the stakeholders in the uh, clouds, you know, ecosystem like the cloud service providers, managed service providers, startups, governments, and so on. Uh, so which will actually help in accelerating the adoption of cloud, both by the industry and the government, and also you know help startups to come out with an, uh, with you know innovative tools for uh, uh, these cloud services. So. Yeah, Rima. These are the various initiatives that we have undertaken. Gentlemen and lady, thank you very much for joining us on this very insightful uh, discussion. Cloud computing does look like a win-win. Services are getting faster, cheaper because it's pay-as-you-go model. Plus, it brings in more resilience, agility, scalability, as well as efficiency. And truly, today, uh, business, both enterprise side as well as government and technology, has become inseparable right now. Thank you once again. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Hello everyone, hope you are doing well. As you are all aware, businesses are embracing the new world, wherein business continuity amongst the disruption, trying to build an organization which is more adaptive and resilient, looking at new modes of harnessing the technology and talent, and looking at opportunities of business growth without boundaries, have become the key imperatives. There is an emerging need for solutions which are ultra flexible and allows the enterprises and organizations the flexibility to grow their business operations without any boundaries. At Tata Tele Business Services, we are very proud to introduce SmartFlow. It's a multimodal, multifunctional, flexible, scalable, secure and reliable suite of cloud communication services. SmartFlow, our future-ready communication suite, is intelligently designed with a lot of innovation built in to take care of today's requirement of hybrid work environment. It is extremely easy to set up without any CapEx investment, without any installation charges, and completely works on a managed services model so there are no hassles of managing a network infrastructure. It offers scalability on demand, reliability, and enterprise-grade security, and also it's backed by a service guarantee of 99.5% uptime. It also offers enterprises to have deep engagement with their customers through a seamless communication suite with anytime, anywhere communication. 
so i invite you all to be part of this journey and looking at a new world of business without boundaries which is powered by smart flow so it's time to flow forward thank you Welcome to AI and Cloud Summit, a virtual summit brought to you in collaboration with Dell Technologies. The theme of the day is the future of businesses with AI managed cloud. Introducing Mayuri Danai, the CIO of Pitalite Industries, Mr. Jaddi Ishramaswamy, CIO of Hindalco, and Mr. Bhuvan Lota, Vice President Digital at Mahindra Group. And I am Reema Tendulkar from CNBC TV 18. Now, business and technology strategies have become inseparable now. Technology architecture has become critical to every organization, and the pandemic has only acted as a trigger for adoption. So, Mayur, uh, you know, the first infrastructure which people have been investing in is cloud. So, can you talk about what is your cloud strategy? Are all your workloads on cloud? Yeah. Uh, so cloud has been one of the foundational building blocks uh, from an IT strategy perspective for us. And uh, we can say that our adoption as cloud has also evolved alongside the growing maturity of the cloud services that are on offer today. So we start, when we started off a few years ago, it was with the mass user commoditized uh, kind of functionality like email, file sharing, collaboration, all that sort of stuff, instant messaging, uh, gradually moving on to infrastructure as a service, uh, then moving on to platform as a service. And now we are leveraging and looking at uh, extensively, extensively leveraging AI services of the cloud. Uh, now, some of the applications that we have not considered for, for cloud so far, uh, uh, one of them is our core ERP infrastructure, the core ERP system, and some of our R&D applications, which are air gap, which are not connected to the internet for reasons of confidentiality, IP, et cetera. But other than that, uh, from an IT strategy standpoint, we are pretty much cloud first. Uh, when we look to deploy a new service or a new application or a new workflow, uh, the question that we really ask is, uh, why not in the cloud rather than why in the cloud? So that's been our strategy from uh, from a cloud perspective and how it fits into our overall um, IT strategy and IT landscape. But apart from uh, confidentiality, is there any other reason why you would not move X application to the cloud? You spoke about core ERND, for instance. Yeah, so the core ERP system is what I referred to. Um, I don't think there is a fundamental uh, or conceptual reason why would, we would not move our ERP systems to the cloud in the future. There are still some questions uh, to be answered around latency, performance of some of these core systems, particularly when accessed from remote locations, etc. cetera. Uh, but I guess the primary reason why we are not, uh, our ERP is not on the cloud today is we have some investments, uh, uh, some assets that need to be sweated before we can consider a move to the cloud. But we are thinking in, in that direction. We are also thinking in terms of having a possible disaster recovery site for our ERP systems on the cloud. So we may, we may start from that direction and, and then move backwards to our primary uh, primary ERP, so SAP, HANA systems. Uh, Jagdish, you're an old economy manufacturer with a variety of machines, legacy applications. What were the challenges that as you migrated to cloud and what is your cloud strategy? Yeah, interesting question. While you say we are old or a legacy manufacturing, I think in the digital world, those uh, boundaries are now vanishing. Yes, our factories are a little old and also the assets are a little old. But from a standpoint of technology and uh, cloud and digital adoption, I'll tell you how we have uh, moved. One, if you look at the assets which we are now trying to get specifically on three themes. One is how do we improve the utilization of factories? Second is how do we improve the quality of our goods? Third is how do we improve the cost? So to all the three, Migration to cloud was one of our strategies in addition to a lot many things that we did. So uh, for a, from a digital perspective, because we are old, we had to first of all get some of those uh, digital sensors up and running on some of the machines. We did work with uh, mainly, we do have partners 
like Oracle, Microsoft, and Azure with whom we work. And we have basically also have a group wide in Aditi Bella group. We have a group wide cloud that we use for migration of data. So what we did was we actually first started migrating our data in the ASIS form, whatever it is, to the local uh, Aditi Bella cloud, and then looked at the gaps in terms of where the data is not available, well, which are the gaps in the sensor that we need to plug in. And that's how we approach the entire gap and how we are migrating to cloud. The data has not been easy and we are still in progress. I wouldn't say the journey is complete. We are just in the progress, in the process of doing it. But the lessons learned is there is nothing called a legacy manufacturer or new manufacturer. And the challenges, all of us face the same challenge of how do you acquire data? How do you take the data to the cloud with security being a biggest concern in terms of OT and IT? How are you going to get the data travel from OT to IT? And that is where I think legacy companies like us have a larger and bigger challenge. But otherwise, it's been acquisition of data, OT, IT security, and getting, getting the right cloud partner and getting the data back to the cloud. So we are approaching it exactly the same way uh, like anybody else would do as far as migration is concerned. The thought process is why not cloud, cloud first. Uh, Bhuvan, the automotive sector has embraced technology like no other. We're talking about autonomous driving, electric vehicles are becoming mainstream. First, if you could enumerate what is your cloud strategy? All right. Uh, first of all, thanks for having me. Um, in terms of our cloud strategy, look, our cloud strategy is to be cloud first. Everything new that we do by default needs to be on the cloud. Yeah. Now, there is a whole bunch of things that are not new. And we are also thinking of migrating that to cloud as well, including ERP. And we have the same constraints that Mayu talked about, infrastructure that needs to be sweated, business case that needs to be built, and then latency issues and so on. In addition, uh, some of our um, high performance computing and uh, in-plant computing. Uh, manufacturing execution system, et cetera, still run on-prem. But we are actively looking at how we can make a case for being more agile by being cloud first. Uh, but anything new that we do, including things that we do to refresh our applications, is going to be on the cloud. Okay, so that's about the cloud strategy. Since uh, the topic and the theme is uh, the overlay of AI services on cloud, Mayur, can you tell us about the value that you see about using AI on cloud? What kind of use cases might need to be custom built versus what could be directly leveraged off the cloud? Yeah, so uh, cloud computing uh, is now layered with uh, AI capabilities, uh, helping organizations like us effectively manage our data, uh, look for patterns, insights in information, deliver customer experiences, optimize our operations, workflows, etc. Uh, interestingly, the top cloud players, whether it's Amazon or Microsoft or Google, have models, uh, AI models that have been trained with massive amounts of data over uh, the past several years. And it would be difficult for any enterprise uh, of our size and scale to match that level of sophistication in a, uh, in a short period of time. Uh, now, these services could be as diverse as image recognition, uh, uh, for, for, for example, in our case, identifying colors and, sh and shades for our art and st uh, stationary businesses at, at the retail shops, uh, text recognition, chatbots, language processing, even demand forecasting. I think there are uh, two categories of use cases, one that are very generic in nature and one that are very specific to one's industry. Now, if you look at the ones that are uh, specific to our industry, for example, uh, our business and uh, the nature of our business requires us to work very closely with our end users. And our end when I mean end users, it's people who actually use, buy and use our products. These are people like carpenters or contractors. Uh, it requires us to work very closely with them over long periods of time to build trust in, in the product. Uh, and hence, when uh, we look at some of the uh, uh, AI or advanced analytics uh, applications and we look at use cases, in field marketing, for example, when you try to answer questions like which end users should we meet? How, how should we classify them? How frequently should we meet, meet each category of end users? What should be the mode of meeting? What products should be positioned to them? Uh, they're very specific to our ways of working. They're very specific to our business model. 
and we would look at custom building these kind of applications uh, on the other hand there are many use cases that are uh, that are fairly horizontal in the sense they apply to a uh, wide variety of industries for example doing kyc for our customers using image recognition uh, text rec recognition uh, natural language processing uh, its use in chatbots for example using natural language processing to write out specific actions and insights from reports and dashboards these can be very generic and can be applied across uh, industries fairly horizontally another example which we could just straight away leverage of the cloud and we do is uh, is web analytics for example uh, tools like google analytics that help us categorize leads across different categories whether it's organic uh, search referral across social media like instagram twitter facebook cloud works far better it, it's already there uh and there is no need to really invest to reinvent the wheel um there are some uh, there are some use cases that also sit right in the middle uh and example that comes to mind is a, a product recommendation use case which is a fairly common use case adopted across several industries uh i think it's it's quite industry specific uh, every industry would have their own way of recommending products to either customers or sales people who uh who would position this product to a customer uh the likes of amazon have been at it for years so they have fairly evolved uh, models now and while in the beginning we have a we had a custom built model for it now we are actively looking at uh, leveraging some of these cloud based applications where uh, a lot of parameterization etc is possible now uh they've become fairly evolved mature over a period of time so i think uh, it's a horses for courses policy when it comes to what can be directly leveraged and uh what you need to custom build for your business uh so jatish can you share how you have harnessed the value of ai when it comes to say uh bettering your production lines improving the asset utilization you know bringing in resiliency to your um, value chain can you share some examples Yes. So let's look at. See, I look at AML as not. It's not a panacea for all your problems, right? So first of all, for AI and ML to work, you need good quality of data first. So let let me go one by one the examples that you asked areas. One, if I look start from operations, how do you predict failures of uh, assets? There we have used the AI, AI based models. So basically, study the pattern of uh, how the assets work. and then look at failure patterns of the past history of 3 to 5 years wherever we had data and then look at predicting the future failure so today's world with ai and ml is more about predicting the uh, future than uh, analyzing the past right so we have bought some of the applications which are ai based for predictive maintenance we have got the data on to the cloud or in some cases on premise on top of it we have built the models and we have put an ai which continuously relearns the model as the pattern changes so that is one we are leveraged ai the second we have leveraged ai to improve quality again proactively so if i have to take example in our case uh, when you look at uh, the aluminum industry what finally the customer or the consumer gets is a finished product out of aluminum let's take an example of an aluminum can that all of us use in the beverages right now any problem that you have in that sheet aluminum sheet that is going to be used for making the can it can cause a huge amount of damage to the bottler or the uh, end user who is actually putting the drinks in the can and closing it so what we have done is how can you predict the quality of the coil of the foil that we are producing in our factory using the data from our customer returns using the data of our process parameters and building the ai engine on top of it to really predict whether this customer is likely to have a problem when this particular material from hindalco gets rolled in his shop floor so we are able to use ai now to really predict what can happen in our customers floor and avoid a quality defect that can cost a lot of uh, wastage of money and scrap for us so the earlier you adopt the ai and bring it to process parameter we are able to now predict quality much ahead of time so we are almost getting now when i say much ahead of time it could be anywhere between uh, 10 days to 15 days we are able to prevent what could be a very disaster 
at the end of the line or even into the customer shop. So we have used AI based model for prediction of quality of the customer as well as in the files. The third area I'll tell you how AI is being used. If you look at uh, us, we are a commodity based industry, right? So how the commodity prices move, uh, you know that we are very heavy on raw material in terms of cost. If you look at my cost, I think primary cost is coming from raw material, second is power, third is logistics. So when we talk about raw material costing, it depends on how well are you able to predict the movement of your raw material cost and buy the inventory according to where you get the best cycle. Typically today here in the market, a lot of people who predict what the so-called analysts who do predict the uh, the market price of these commodities. And when I say commodity, I'll talk about coal or a pet coke or oil, which is a huge consumption that we make. Now, what we have done is we have said, how can we improve the prediction of these commodity prices much in advance? So typically a quarter in advance. Now, when you get a prediction model, which can predict the pricing of these commodities, let's say one quarter in advance, it helps you to look at how do you want to do your sourcing strategy. So earlier, it is like every quarter, we used to have the contracts, customer supplier contracts are a quarter or a year or a six months. Now with AIML, what's happening is, if you're able to exactly use those indicators, which are the best predictors of the commodity price, you are now able to negotiate and much better agility in your sourcing cycles. So we have now done a procurement based uh, predictive analytics to see whether we can predict the commodity pricing like a oil or a pet coke much ahead of time so that we are able to control our inventory and also the cost, procurement cost as well as how do you optimize our inventory. So this is another use there where we have done the usage of uh, AIML. Third example, I'll give you logistics. Now, logistics and what does it does? Typically, what you do in a transport is that you basically take the distance which you know that so far you have been traveling historically, and then typically we do a per mile, per kilometer uh, distance, and then do the costing. Now, what we have done using AI, advanced analytics and uh, machine learning, is we have really studied. Well, actually, the, the way the logistics is planned versus the actual route that the trucks travel or the time that they take or the distance they actually travel, we are now able to predict a lot more opportunities for cost optimization in the way logistics is done. So it gives us route, route optimization. It gives us loading optimization. It gives us cost optimization. It also gives us who are your best transporters that you should be using for your best cost as well as making sure deliveries do not slip beyond the time. So we have now applied an AML model on what we call as a logistics insight tower. We call it as an LIT, which gives us insights on the way we move goods, the way we move, and then what the best way to you know organize yourself to get cost reduction and without sacrificing the, uh, you know, the time that you will take to deliver. At the same time, not going in for the lowest cost supplier we are now able to choose transporters based on their holistic performance of which route they take, how predictable they are, how many times they actually reach the uh, time on spot, how many stops do they take on the way, how much distance they travel per, per day on an average. All of this is now being used to put in a predictive model, which is basically giving us a huge power in our hands to make better decisions. So I'll give you three examples how we are using AI across our value chain to make better decisions today. And all of these are work in progress, but we are seeing huge benefits just to start with. And there's a lot more to be had as we mature these models over time. Uh, Bhuvan, same question to you. Uh, at the Mahindra Group, what makes sense to uh, customize and build by yourself organically? And what makes sense? Where should you directly leverage off uh, you know, cloud-based services which are provided, the analytics provided by cloud service companies? Yeah. So for us, at least in the automotive sector, uh, the use cases are very diverse. There are use cases all the way from how to score a lead using AI and determine whether that person who came to a website needs to be called or sent an SMS. Uh, all the way down from there to using data to ensure that we 
test our engines in the best way possible, which means there are three types of tests. There is a cold test, hot test, and then load test. Getting data out of cold test and figuring out whether I need to do a hot test or not for that engine is very important for the quality of the engine. Uh, but if we do all these three tests, the throughput of the engines is low. So there are multiple and various different types of uh, use cases. I think like uh, Mayur was saying, there are a few commodity ones. For example, product recommendation, for example, lead scoring. These are algorithms that have been built over a period of time, tested, trained, etc. And it makes a lot of sense to take them as is and then build on top, right? So I would take a ready-made engine to do my lead scoring and then add my layer of knowledge and data on it to refine that engine. But when it comes to predicting whether an engine needs to be load tested or not, that's probably need to be built custom because a lot of historical data that have been emitted out of my machines need to be ingested in order to actually build that algorithm. All of that can go to the cloud. We can use the power of compute there, come back with an answer uh, and execute. So I think it, it depends on the context. A lot of commodity exists, which is being used, but a lot of custom building is also happening, uh, which is exciting. Mm. Uh, so Bhuvan, you know, there was this uh, Deloitte survey which uh, threw up that 49% of the companies that have deployed AI are using cloud-based services for that. Uh, so clearly it appears that enterprises in a way find it easier to adopt cloud-based AI services. Um, because it's tried and tested, because it's commoditized, is that the only reason? How difficult is it to organically build it and build a customized product? Um, it is not difficult. It is easy given that you have the right vision um, and the right set of people behind that vision. Uh, I think the failure of, let me put it that way, success of a POC is always guaranteed. No POCs fail. But when it comes to scaling it up and ensuring that you meet the business case that it was meant to meet is where the trick lies. Uh, it is very easy to make a successful POC on the cloud. But then taking it through the hoops to bring massive amount of data, you know, processing it in the cloud, and then bringing it back onto use cases which impact our operations or our decisions uh, is where the execution becomes difficult. I think the technology is simple. The implementation is hard uh, in, my, in my mind because these are all proven things. Uh, it's a matter of you know changing the mindset and start using those. Mm. Uh, Mayur, uh, you know, on the subject of AI and cloud, they interact with each other, and together it can be extremely transformative. Can you talk about how it's helped improving the productivity, the efficiency, the value that you've generated at Pidilite, bringing the two technologies, cloud as well as AI, to interact with each other? Yeah, so um, like I said earlier, uh, AI is fairly horizontal technology. Um, it can be applied uh, to a variety of different contexts. The same concept can be moved laterally across to a variety of different contexts. Uh, now, manufacturing organizations such as ours um, tend to use it, and I feel rightly so, for optimizing the core of our value chain. Uh, so the core of our value chain is essentially uh, about three things. First is generating demand. Uh, and that's where you uh, answer questions like, how do I interact with my customers? Uh, what can entice them into buying my products? And as Bhuvan said, uh, what's, how should you treat a, a, a lead? Uh, and what should be the basis for which, uh, how the actions do you take to follow up on that lead? So generating demand, uh, that's, the, that's the starting of the supply chain or the value chain. The second is managing your demand. So this is, Figuring out uh, answers to questions like, what is my demand going to be? Uh, what is what is it going to be by product, by geography, by SKU? And hence, how should I price my product? How much should I produce? Uh, so this is, once you've managed demand, the, the last leg of the value chain is actually fulfilling the demand, which is uh, where you take decisions such as inventory, buffer stock decisions, transportation routes, uh, logistics networks, warehouse capacities, etc., and optimizing the whole uh, the, the, the entire uh, fulfillment chain. 
uh, organizations uh, mostly for the most part because this becomes too big of a problem to solve uh, tend to slice all of these problems into smaller uh, sub problems and solve for problems in isolation so you solve for forecasting you solve for capacity constraint capacity planning you solve for distribution planning um, i think the, the the real value gets generated uh, when you optimize the entire chain uh, rather than bits and pieces of it uh, and there are ai based solutions today uh, that uh, can help to optimize the entire value chain together uh, and we are looking at that integrated business planning as uh, you know one solution rather than trying to uh, break it up into multiple smaller sub problems that can be uh, solved for a local optimum so to speak uh, i think uh, we are on that journey yet uh, we are on that journey now but uh, there's a lot more that needs that needs to happen in order to fully leverage the existing uh, ai capability today so understanding uh, the demand forecasting it as well as making sure that your supply chain can fulfill that demand uh, bhuvan uh, in the on the automotive side you know on one hand you also have to optimize your existing core processes you have to keep digitizing but at the same time uh, you know you also are seeing new business models being developed which are the mobility of the future how are you tackling this and what is the value that you've seen from the leads the analytics which ai has generated all right fantastic so look the amount of data that's being generated at this moment is humongous to say the least there is data being generated when the customer is researching for a vehicle right so they they tend to put out what they want there is data being generated as they go through a customer journey which is they talk to a call center there is data they go to a test drive there is data they go to a dealership there is data and then there is data being generated when they actually use our vehicle after purchasing it right the trip data the vehicle status the customer driving behaviors and so on the amount of data that's being generated is significant that itself plus the power of cloud computing and the the power of what can be done with this data together is creating these new business models right and these business models can be as small as predicting you know failure of a component and hence driving a customer down to a uh, to a dealership or to workshop to get a repair done in order to help the customer or to inform you know uh, the driving behavior of the customer uh, which which then determines the insurance type that he is eligible for or she is eligible for it can be very very different kind of things some of these are regulated because there is limited amount of things that we can do with data and some of this is not but the point is the more you look at the data the more use cases emerge and suddenly it becomes unmanageable so it is very important for us at at the automotive industry to realize what is important data for us for the use cases that we really want to get into and what is not because storing this data processing it cleaning it is not easy and expensive and then putting it in the right platform throwing the right tools and expertise at it and then ensuring that we ex extract insights out of this data and quickly turn them into use cases that help our customers with either a new business model or a new service or just a delight point for our experience uh, is very important and that's something that we are focusing on ensuring that we look at our data carefully first we integrate that uh, front and back uh, and then create vertical slices of use cases that can be brought to market very quickly learn from that and see if new business models emerge uh, and we are in the cycle of uh, doing that right now a uh, very interesting you know we keep extolling the virtues of uh, the data that is being generated and how we can analyze it and its extract maximum value but in a way there is also not all the data is critical and there could be some noise signals which emerge from that uh, data so there are uh, you know mayur clearly um, you know issues that businesses can face in collecting and storing what uh, you know bhuvan call humongous data that is being generated could you share your thoughts on what you've experienced at fidelite 
yeah, I mean, uh, I completely agree with that. Uh, I think organizations are looking at using all the data at their disposal to uh, derive insights. Uh, most importantly, make predictions about the future. The, uh, the capability to make predictions about the future, I think that's uh, a fairly cap powerful capability to have for any organization in any industry. Uh, now, this requires a fair amount of capability on both the digital and the analytics end. Uh, and it's not uh, a simple job to build for most organizations. Now, if you dig a little deeper to the next level, this requires four kinds, broadly four kinds of abilities. It is, first of all, the ability to capture meaningful information. Now, this meaningful information uh, could be regarding your sales process, your operations, your finance processes, uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, having generated information, the next ability is to ingest and store large amounts of data. Uh, again, today, depending on uh, the nature of the industry one is in, uh, there is large amounts of data that is getting generated. Uh, even from mobile apps and behaviors of, uh, of consumers who use our apps, there is a fair amount of information that can be gleaned. So there is huge amounts of data. Uh, on the manufacturing side, there are connected devices and uh, which are virtually streaming data uh, data tags every uh, few seconds. Uh, the third is the ability to use algorithms uh, to draw patterns and correlations and then use them to make predictions about the future. Uh, and then the fourth is, of course, what we call machine learning, which is the ability to continuously improve these algorithms, with providing them with more richer and, and better meaning data. So there is a lot of work in, uh, there's a lot of so-called plumbing work in actually capturing all the information, uh, then ingesting it, uh, then applying algorithms on it, uh, using them to make predictions about the future, and then constantly improving it. Uh, so uh, from our own experience, uh, we have had to build and rebuild uh, quite a few of our legacy systems and applications, a lot of hygiene work. Uh, a lot of foundational system work uh, in order to, uh, at the ERP end, at the at the sales automation end, uh, at the CRM end, to actually capture the data that we need uh, and at the right level of granularity. Uh, and then once you have done that, uh, then the next part is to actually use it to to start drawing the insights that you need. I think this requires a fair amount of uh, talent, uh, the organizational will. Uh, and of course, the right levels of IT infrastructure, and most importantly, requires a fair bit of time because some of these, uh, you know, to capture the data, to to train it, to refine it, to improve it, uh, it it is not an overnight job. So some of the AI services that you see that are on offer today, uh, they have evolved over several years of uh, of usage of huge amounts of data from customers across the world uh, of training, labeling, et cetera. So there is, uh, there is a lot of uh, uh, work that goes on behind the scenes to, uh, to make things work seamlessly and at scale. Mm. Uh, Bhuvan, just getting back to that earlier point about the challenges thrown up by the vast amount of data that is being generated, has there been any instance, any example that you can share in terms that uh, the, the insight that was thrown up by analyzing the data that you generated, it didn't work for the company. Yeah, I'll give you both. One that could not work and the one that uh, we made work. Um, so look, the current situation with the auto industry is such that nobody can predict demand. The, and the problem with data is we can only look backward. We cannot look forward. Right? So all the data that we have about our consumer pattern, buying behaviors, uh, model mix, uh, affordability, et cetera, is all about the past. And most of it is pre-COVID. We have about a year of data of COVID times as well. None of that can be analyzed to build a model of uh, demand in the future, right? So no matter how much data we have, how much data we have captured about customer behavior, different touch points, it is not going to help us create a model that tells us, you know, which region will sell which kind of vehicles uh, more than the other one. That's one example. Second example where we made, made it work is a different example uh, in our paint shop. Uh, paint shop is one of the most extensive 
units of a plant manufacturing plant and each each car is painted with robots and these robots are tuned depending on certain controllable and non controllable parameters uh, what we did was we captured all the data that was being thrown up by our robots and other uh, ambient data that was in the paint shop and we captured how defects were being handled so then we found that there are 13 types of defects there could be peeling there could be dust there could be uh, linting and so on and then we figured out how these defects correlate back to our machine parameters temperature humidity of the booth and so on uh, and then we figured out that by doing a small change to controllable parameters like temperature and humidity of the booth we were able to reduce defects by more than 50% and hence reduce rework right now this is temperature data is in a way right it is noise it does not matter whether it is 27 degrees or 24 degrees but when you correlate it back to our quality and the rework amount that we were doing in the paint shop we were able to actually reduce defects and rework by more than 50% so in this case seemingly noise data was put to use to change uh, you know humidity and temperature control for our paint shop and we were able to achieve fantastic results out of it so the, here are the two examples of where a lot of valuable data couldn't do anything a lot of data which had, which was earlier noise uh, could give us fantastic outcomes um so jagdish uh, given the penetration of ai in almost every sector uh, today uh, we've seen a variety of use cases where ai integrated cloud has become pervasive in businesses across sectors looking from this perspective do you think cloud managed by ai is what we are heading into absolutely you know uh, when we talk about ai and ml it applies to the it and the function itself and when you talk about it i'm talking about how do you manage your infrastructure how do you manage your applications how do you manage agility now when you talk about cloud manage ai managed cloud it is absolutely a must because you look at today when we talk about business first one is agility second is the speed of uh, response and third challenge for us when we go to cloud the the business leaders are you know not very sure about the responsiveness of a cloud application so there is always this fear that you know oh if you put it in the cloud maybe my data will get lost or maybe the response will be very slow maybe i will not get a predictive uh, performance of the application so when you talk about an uh, infrastructure and application availability in the order of 99.999999 imagine that unless you have a infrastructure and the entire ecosystem managed by ai which automatically continuously optimizes your infrastructure in terms of availability predicts what is the resource that is required predicts the traffic on the network predicts the data that is going to flow between your uh, among applications unless you have ai ml embedded in this it is going to become very difficult for you to manage your business expectations with a lot of data getting increased at the same time business wanting the agility and the responsiveness so the only answer to this is your cloud environment has to be managed with ai ml and this is happening today i think we see a lot of cloud based uh, you know ai based cloud management not only cloud i think how you manage infrastructure how you manage your application how you manage your database how you manage your security using ai today you look at uh, security you know information security the entire logic or algorithm today is ai based we are moving away from those you know the agent based anti virus sitting on your device now today to ai based prediction models that is able to find issues much ahead of time so i think ai is all over the place in if you look at cloud everywhere it is there the infrastructure it is in the application it is in the security layer it is in the database layer today we talk about autonomous database which is it cleans itself it self heals itself it optimizes itself so everything about optimization self optimization self healing is all ai based today in the entire cloud architecture and uh, all of the applications so it's it's prevalent pervasive everywhere and that's the way to go that's that's where we are going to go uh, 
the future is there only. Uh, Mayur, we've been talking about how AI and cloud computing go hand in hand. They're working together. Is there any downside of this association that companies should be taking note of? Yeah, I knew that question was coming. Uh, yeah, we've spoken uh, largely about benefits uh, and like everything, while there are numerous benefits, uh, there are a fair amount of drawbacks as well. I think for me, the first drawback is uh, when you're leveraging AI services of the cloud, uh, there is a need to be constantly connected. Uh, so when it's implemented in cloud-based services, it needs persistent internet connectivity and poor internet connectivity can actually hinder the advantages of having deployed something on cloud and actively leveraging it uh, on the fly. The processing uh, processing data on the cloud itself is uh, is faster than conventional computing uh, uh, because you have specialized uh, infrastructure for the same. But there is also a time lag in transmitting data to the cloud and, and back and forth. Uh, so when you have situations where you have a machine learning algorithm that gets triggered from a mobile app that's being used in, uh, let's say, the hinterland or semi from a semi-urban territory, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, uh, you can have uh, you can have issues of uh, latency and hence uh, performance, which is uh, not uh, not what you desire. Uh, the second aspect, uh, the second downside is the uh, the, the whole concept of uh, the privacy of data. So all applications, like we've discussed, require a large amount of data that includes consumer data, that includes vendor information, and so on and so forth. A lot of sensitive information going back and forth. Uh, and this can be uh, specifically targeted for data breaches by hackers. So uh, it needs enterprises need to put a lot of uh, thought behind uh, managing and governing uh, data. They need to know what exactly is the data, where is it getting stored. There can be regulatory considerations around uh, privacy considerations around what you store, depending on the uh, on uh, on the geography that you operate in, and so on and so forth. So. That's a second. Uh, it's not a downside, but it's some. It's a watch out. Uh, the third is, of course, uh, like both Bhuvan and myself uh, have said, uh, we have a lot of legacy infrastructure. It's a hybrid setup. Some applications hosted on-prem, some applications in the cloud. Now we are adding a layer of intelligence uh, in the cloud through the AI services, uh, leveraging APIs, and so on and so forth. So there are significant. Uh, 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 integration challenges in, in moving this data back and forth, making sure it uh, integrates well, it works seamlessly, uh, and the end uh, and the end outcome is exactly what you desire. So I think this is these are some of the things to watch out for when we actually leverage. Uh, and some strategy could be to gradually move everything uh, to the cloud so that you uh, minimize some of these challenges. So bandwidth, privacy, as well as digitizing legacy uh, applications. Uh, uh, one final question. What about uh, technology skill gap? I think both of you made a fleeting reference to that. Uh, could you share your thoughts? Is there really a cap capability gap that we are currently facing in implementation? Yes and no. Um, the gap is more about the mindset and less about the capabilities. I think with cloud, comes a need for constant learning and unlearning. And a lot of our uh, traditional IT departments are not used to it. Yeah. The, the other thing with cloud is it is um, an OPEX model, which is pay as you go. And having the right capabilities to manage cloud can ensure significant savings in the longer run. At least in the traditional industries like ours, uh, I think there is there is a gap of people who are capable of running an efficient machine, uh, machinery when it comes to cloud-based applications, large ones, not just POCs. Like Mayur was saying, what if we put our ERP on the cloud? You'll need people who know how to manage that as an infrastructure again, as against people who've been managing their data center for a long time. Uh, we are also struggling to do that, uh, but I think the intent is to build capabilities over a period of time so that we are able to run in the cloud as efficiently as we are currently running in our data centers. And this requires, of course, uh, you know, attracting talent from uh, the technology sector into some of our 
industries like manufacturing and also upskilling our current people so that they realize and appreciate how cloud can make uh, you know a significant change to how they work and how it is here to make a big big difference to the business etc gentlemen thank you very much uh, for uh, joining in it's very interesting insights and in how you can unlock opportunities to drive data uh, driven intelligent uh, decision making the value that you can extract using a combination of ai as well as cloud computing thank you gentlemen once again pleasure being here thank you thank you thank you, thank you.